everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Good Anime Palette Podcast. This is episode number 77, and just because we are in 2024 does not mean we don't look back in time and see what anime and manga back then is all about, because this week's episode is about 2023 anime retrospective. Going back in time is yours truly, Jason, as well as my time machine co-pilot, Will. What's yeah. up? Yeah, we're not going to be leaving things in the past. Um, so uh, one thing that we did kind of impromptu last year around this time was, uh, well, this is more because I was bored and had watched a fuck ton of anime because I was chasing a bunch of shit. Um, I decided, oh, I wonder how all anime have performed over the past uh, year, which at the time was 2022. Uh, and so we put together a bunch of uh, spreadsheets collating all the productions and all the scores of all the anime that come out uh, that according is, is according to the Mal database. Um, so I don't think we have a, do we have a rules page or not so much a rules page, but like a disclaimer. Okay, so we do. So we do have a disclaimer page on our website detailing how we go about putting together this list. Um, so again, specifically, these are all stats and details that come from my anime list. Um, now, I know there's other uh, databases that we can use, but this is the most popular one, and this is also the one that Jason and I frequently use, so that's what we're going to be sticking with. Yeah, and we have the best kind of idea of what certain numbers mean, because uh, in statistics, sometimes you can kind of twist or shape the truth depending even the numbers are unchanged well there's also some some things where it's like we just don't understand like if we were looking at rankings on like anime corner yeah right like yeah. i i wouldn't be able to interpret what the fuck's going on like nothing so. against you guys in anime corner i just don't know what you guys are doing in that corner because i haven't been there long enough to understand yeah that's all so we're gonna get things started off with winter 2023 one whole year ago uh and remember this was also the year where things were starting to come out of like post pandemic crunches where like studios were shut down or put things, things were put on this uh, delay. Um, there were a lot of series last year that for, for better or for worse um, just could not continue. And like, for example, uncle Isekai near automata, these are like just a few examples of series that got off like, you know, five to seven episodes and then midway, shut down and then we had to wait like a whole two three months before new episodes would come out actually no i think it was even longer for um uncle isekai for example yeah and uh some even hype shows on netflix yeah. also got affected too yeah uh well we'll probably get into that uh one thing i do want to say mention right off the bat even though it is mentioned on our rules pages uh i think going forward for all of these retrospectives uh will took the steered the ship and i think not only I did assist a bit here and there, but very few and far between, but it's also to kind of keep me in the dark to give a different perspective. Yeah, I think I know all the numbers. That I think is very healthy, even though we do have the spreadsheet in front of us while we record. Yeah, this is your first time properly seeing everything laid out. And right? processing it. And I think that kind of, uh, you know, dichotomy is, is like a good thing in this particular instance. So that's kind of what we're going going forward. But I will have my own kind of impressions and thoughts uh, of the season and maybe a few things here and there offhand as well. Yeah. So unfortunately, um, I somehow lost uh, our copy of uh, the anime retrospective of 2022 uh, so that we can't really do much of a comparison. But I can say that that year was almost like a record low in terms of anime productions. There was a lot of series uh, that were delayed, that were shut down. Um, and for better, it was, it was just in the end, like, we were running with like 30 something to 40 something series coming out per season. Uh, this time around, things are different. So we start off winter 2023 uh, by mentioning that uh, the number of series that came out that, uh, that season was 54. Quite a lot. I think that's basically like just a little bit above like the standard number of series that come out uh, per season. Yeah, I think more or less uh, 45 to 50 is the standard number with probably only half of them being the more well-known in the West, at least. Now, the one thing that is surprising is we, we talk about how, like, while spring and fall tend to be very strong performing seasons, winter and summer are a little bit more in the doldrums. We actually started off 2023 
quite strong. The average score across all anime series was a 7.167. So all of them, like you know, when you collect them together, performed above average. Um, so and these were, are all n- just new shows, not continuing. New right? shows that have a score on my anime list. So there's right. still some that are like not applicable. Um, we didn't put those in there just because it would just fuck up the, the numbers, right? Yeah. So uh, of the 54, around nine uh, percent or five series uh, were scored between an eight and 8.99, with a majority of the series scoring between a seven and 7.99. 26 series or just under 50 percent. One third of them were ranked uh, 6 to 6.99, so that's 18, uh, and a very low number, actually. Only five series of that season uh, were rated between a 5 to 5.99. Nothing I, below that. And I think the, especially the 7 to 7.99 being half of, uh, comprising half of the entire uh, amount of shows is very normal. I think when Will and I recorded winter 2024 seasonals, and it was overwhelmingly almost like 75 percent of it is in the 7.799 that is kind of very surprising but a welcome surprise nonetheless right yeah so now we're going to break down the seasonal like a breakdown of the uh, studio performances and uh there's going to be some no-brainers here right uh there the 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 five uh the five series that ranked uh between 8.99 were produced by bones mappa PA Works and Kyoto Animation. Mappa doing two of them, uh, right? Uh, the, the again, just because I'm looking at the Malice. Vinland same Saga time. was one of them. Yeah, Vinland Saga. Um, Bones was a uh, Bungo Stray Dogs, uh, and then uh, JC Staff was ranked third that season with uh, Dungeon. Ma- uh, sorry, Dan Machi. Dan Machi. Dan Machi. Uh, oh, which was uh, season four, four part right? two. Yeah, that's it. Um, so yeah, um, they. All, all, all very good productions. I think uh, what's also interesting is that there weren't all that many studios that had done more than one uh, series. Yeah, I w- remember. I remember when we did our other retrospective. Cloverworks was was really burning the midnight oil yeah, on the production. Some side. seasons they had like four productions. Some at the minimum they had two. Wasn't that the year they had? Uh, the what, what was Spy Family came out that season and that, that year they also had that's not um, Tokyo Ward year right th- that was Tokyo Ward year as well. and then Horimiya was Tokyo Ward year Horimiya Peace is this year uh, but Horimiya the one before I think it was the year before that uh, 2021 okay, okay. So. yeah uh, so there were four studios that produced two uh, productions um, for uh, for last year Zero G uh, though one of them was a co-production with uh, Studio Liber or Lieber Mappa with two JC Staff with two and Silver Link with two. Uh, all of them actually did pretty well. Uh, Mappa you know, performing really, really well with an average of 8.23 for a mouse score. Uh, the lowest of them was Silver Link, but they still managed to put together a 7.055, uh, which is pretty admirable. Um, and then there were a lot of other studios that just did you know, one episode, uh, one series. But generally, I would say that for the most part, the studios you expected to do things well did them well so uh yeah like jc staff did well orange orange did well because they had um stampede. Trigun stampede yeah yep. stampede madhouse starting off the year with a 7.44 that one is also a decent showing i think that you know if you're looking at studios that did not do very well uh and this is kind of hard to pick on them but dogokobo Dokobo was sitting uh, with a 6.52. Um, that was, the, the I think, the, the lowest showing uh, for this year. Right, especially when you consider the same production animation studio that did Oshinoko. It is a very big, drastic difference. Yep. Oshinoko will feature later on in this uh, this episode as well. Uh, A1 Pictures, 7.52. I think, like... You- Do you remember that Dogokobo <clears throat> production? Not the Oshinoko one? Uh, no. Uh, what it? if it involves a bunch of guys? That's a mixed media project that you oh. watched and actually talked about. Oh. Um. That was the worst of the season for a long while. Technoroid oh, no. Overmind. Okay. For a minute, when you said a lot of boys mixed media, I thought for a minute it was... Um, Hypno- Hypnosis yeah, Mike? Yeah, that one's A1, right? No, but that, yeah, but that yeah. one's like... Dumb good, right? Yeah. This yeah, one's yeah, just yeah, 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 yeah. dumb dumb. Yeah. Just looking at like the, the the bottom performers, I don't think there's any like studio that really like is like shocking um that they're at the bottom. Okay, maybe Sunrise. 
Uh, but that's because I don't think Summers is working on a mecha or an action for that season. Um, they, they they averaged a, a six point eight one uh, at the time. That I remember these these were like you know scores that were collated at the beginning of January. So they may have changed a bit here and there, but it shouldn't really you know matter all that much. So I don't think anything's going to be changing like decimal points. Yeah. And Beyond. to be fair to Sunrise, uh, the one that is six point eight one is a four coma manga, right? Uh, short, so it's twelve episodes, three minutes long. Usually, these ones are very low ranked because they're kind of spin offs, offshoots, bonuses of the main series, which is um, uh, it's about an idol club member. Yeah. So, so yeah, in, in terms of like the the best performing anime. For winter 2023, uh, it was the second season of Vinland Saga with an 8.80 done by Mappa. Uh, so that's what you know brought up the average for Mappa. I think that if we were to factor in, you know, they were doing two productions. Uh, would you mind seeing if you can find uh, the the second production that Mappa did? Because um, I can't remember um, which one they did. Uh, yeah, I- I'll-, I'll check as as you uh, keep going. Yeah, the lowest performing, uh, and of course, then meaning that the worst performing studio for Winter 2023 goes to Inukai, that was produced by Studio Quad. Listen, listen, guys, listen. I understand if you are a dog, and you just want to be caressed with a bunch of ladies. Uh, boy, do I have the anime for you that is not only a physical, literal dumpster fire, but, like, just burn everything, bro. Yeah, with this one, are you talking about the uncensored version or, like, the one that, you know, is... The fact that we have to have that conversation is just in of itself very indicative of what you're getting into. But I would even argue, like, listen, Will, we're both adults, right? We're both past the age of 18, and I think almost all of our listeners are we're all like mature people and we're all into different things right but sometimes you gotta know when stuff is just not good even if they're of a lewd nature yeah yeah so even that even then with like uh inukai being a 5.08 we still had a pretty high average score across the whole season of 7.167 uh so the map to so the map is uh i found it yeah it's uh, you're campfire. gonna kick your yeah you're, yeah, 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 I, was, yeah. I, I pulled it up as well you're gonna kick your yeah, thousand yeah but 7.67 is still very very good so when you factor that in along with the performance that villain saga season two had it's hard to look past mappa being like the best performing studio for this season unless you have you know a counterpoint to it like i mean look bones bones did really really well 8.45 for bungo stray dogs uh that was uh, specifically season four yeah i and uh, again at the same time i think even though it doesn't have the highest score pa works with buddy daddies to me was an extremely good show that doesn't necessarily reinvent the wheel but To me, that is one of the most shining examples of you can do so many things right. You just don't have to do always everything new all the time. Um, And it is a bit kind of crazy that this is not only the first uh, winter 2023 that you would hear this narrative of, I almost like caught myself, of narrative of, listen, listen. What is near doing around this time? They're going to get delayed. What is um, Kubo, uh, Kubo-san? Uh, oh, yeah, that one. Also going to get delayed. Uh, like, so many shows from here on out is going to start people, oh, thinking like, oh, okay, there's no problem. Then all of a sudden, oh, the like the next three episodes... I don't know, man. I think Nier especially took a huge hit in terms of, of the production side. But uh, it's an unfortunate circumstance that I don't think can be blamed on anybody. But nonetheless, it does affect, I guess, not only the momentum for sure, which also in turn affects kind of viewership and people talking about it. It's just unfortunate, but it's the way it is. Yeah, I think that we have what we have here as well is potentially two, maybe three surprises of the season. Um, so, you know, Bones, Mappa, PA Works, KyoAni, even Studio Orange and JC staff, you you more often than not would put your money on them doing good works, right? 
maybe not so much JC staff, but they performed well with an average of 7.835 across two productions. But the ones that I am like most surprised by, maybe not so much for the first one that I'm going to mention, but the second one, project number nine with the angel next door spoils me rotten, uh, brought in an average of 7.92. And now we know the kind of reputation that project number nine has. It tends to do with those kind of age gap, kind of like misaligned couple, like, like romantic uh, subtext 82, series. Right. Yeah. 7.82. Right. Um, so, Maybe that as was a sequel, by the way, as well. Yeah. That was announced later on. So it 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 got enough hype. But I think the one that is the most surprising of them all is Studio Le Deuce producing Tomo Chan as a girl, sitting at a seven point eight one. I mean, it's in the top ten performing series across winter twenty twenty three. And I think the the craziest thing is it's based on a web manga that is based on a manga. That was ages ago, bro. I I read it when I was like, n- like ages ago. You don't want to reveal your age, yeah? Okay, sure. Yeah, I don't really want to reveal my age. You can Google it and figure it out. But uh, it was completed, and it was kind of one of those things. Like, why? Right? Like, there's no re-release. There is no reason that I can see. Maybe there is something behind the scenes where I can kind of point at and be like, oh, I see why you are doing an anime adaptation now. Yeah. So I would say the surprise of the season would be Le Deuce. Uh We also do have Cloverworks, which is sitting at a 6.94, which is absurdly low for what you expect. From, oh, sorry, no, 7.02. Uh, but the thing they were working on was Unite Up, which is one of their, like, their main series. Is that you the know. Flag Boy one? Uh, I think so. High Schooler Loves to Sing gets recruited by a talent agency. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an idol. It's an idol show. Yeah, fair. Yeah. Um. Do you remember how you felt about that season? I mean, obviously, you can look at the shows that you watched and how you feel. Obviously, Vinland Saga probably takes the cake, but you also are a very big fan of Boongo Stray Dogs. Well, there was also, like, you know, um, Handyman Saito-san. I was about to mention that, uh, right? There was also um, the Genius Lady uh, yeah. and uh, uh, Reincarnated Princess. Those were – I thought they were good. I uh, thought they were good. I think Reincarnated Princess and the Genius – yeah, Reincarnated Princess Genius Lady is, to my knowledge, dropped significantly towards the end of the curve, if I remember correctly. It was probably like an 8 at one point, or a high 7s, and then it severely dropped probably after everyone wrapped up um, the the curve. And I feel of two minds about it, but I just feel personally from a very big Yuri GL fan that... It kind of sucks that uh, probably a very good iteration in that genre uh, just didn't stick the landing is all. Yeah, I think I think like you know because you're asking what my general feeling was about Winter 23. I remember we talked about this too. We, during the time we were watching series, I couldn't help but feel that it was kind of like a eh like a mid ish season. Okay, look, we had um, Sugar Fa- uh, Sugar Apple Fairy Tale that came out that season as well. Also has a part two. Yeah, Spy Season Two. Spy Classroom was out too. I was um, disappointed by that. Yeah, that one was not a great show. It, it, it the second season is doing a lot better. What about your favorite show of all time, Tokyo Revengers Christmas Showdown? Look, I mean, like I'm glad that I read the manga, despite like me like still liking the anime. I just can't get over the fact that like Leiden Films is still choosing to animate and also do the character designs the way they've been doing it. It just does not look good for me. Uh, but I think like in general, the, the highlights of the season uh, were really like Bones with Bungo Stray Dogs. Uh, Dragon Stampede was a good showing from Orange, even if you may or may not like the updated version of it. Um, I think maybe also a special shout out to PA Works for uh, Buddy Daddies as well. I oh. think other than uh, Buddy Daddies and... Uh... You know, knowing the pedigree and the hype of the sequels, when I look at what was available and what I watched, probably the thing that stood out the most to me were uh, for winter 2023 was two things. Uh, eventual delays of a lot of series, so it doesn't wrap up, and that sucks for everyone involved. Yeah, we were still very much like in COVID times, but like slowly getting out of it. But unfortunately, studios couldn't really like be fully operational. We don't have any of those issues now. But I would say even though they're not the highest scoring three set of trio of anime, they were by far to me the most memorable of that season, which was the three feel good slice of life shows. I'm talking about farming in another world. K 
Camping Fire, Campfire Isekai, and Handyman Saito. Yep. Are those three were like the perfect trio of isekai, but really feel good, wholesome, and just a nice kind of rest period in a sea and a world of turmoil. Yeah. So I, I'm i very happy despite the... It, yeah, it, it didn't feel like it was a strong season, but a hey, 7.17, 167, that's a pretty, pretty outstanding, like average score across all 54 series and you still had a 5.08 inukai bringing things down so i mean thanks to villain saga for i mean they got looked down upon right the the dog right yeah so we now move into spring 2023 where i don't think we experienced as many delays or disruptions from production studios so um despite saying that though uh significantly fewer series that come out that season 48 across winter as uh, spring 2023 but what is good though is that there were eight shows that were scored an eight to 8.99 uh or around 44 percent were uh, seven to seven point nine nine and then rounding everything out there were 19 shows across five to six point nine nine um so because of the, that there was a smaller sample size and there were more shows that were in like the bottom half of the score rankings uh, it does mean that the average across winter, uh, spring 2024, three was um, a 7.118. Not significantly lower, but still, it doesn't seem like things are going all that well. Uh, we're slowly uh, seeing now maybe a reversal of winter and summer potentially being better than spring and fall. But again, the, the, the margins are so fine, it's hard to make that conclusion. Uh, what I will say is that even though it's, and, and, and again, numbers are like factual right how you interpret it is different right but when i look at the showing oshinoko being the mvp very like influential and impactful of a manga as well as an anime 8.71 being the highest for spring 2023 don't forget who's second place with demon slayer you can't you can't fault anyone for enjoying having a good time including ourselves with demon slayer and then don't forget a little known show called The Dangers in My Heart, probably the biggest point swing I have ever seen in recent memory of what I felt about it and how Will feels about it, where it stood. And then when after everything was said and done, where it ended up in the hierarchy of the season from a Mal perspective. Then out of nowhere, yo, you like production IG, bro? You like uh, Promise Neverland that uh, Clover kind of fucked up a bit? What if I gave you Heavenly Delusions? Then... I love I love Heavenly Delusions. Then you're like, okay, but... Okay, uh, then what about Dr. Stone New World? I mean, that's cool too, but like, bro, Skip and Loafer, can't we not spend another minute, which we are probably going to spend 500 minutes in our lifetime, talking about how awesome Skip and Loafer is. Oh, yeah, I the love The best opening sequence, best OP, and just another nice, good manga that got a very, very good anime adaptation, right? Yep. The lowest scoring of uh, all spring 2023 was Kizuna no Alil, Alile. I don't know how to pronounce that, but with a 5.29. So not quite as low as Inukai, but that does help to bring the average down. Signal MD and with studio. Yeah. So now we're going to be talking about, you know, in general, how each individual production studio performed. So there were five studios that produced more than one series so that's wit studio one of them being a co-production with single md emt squared one of them being a production with uh magic bus jc staff with three and then lighting films and tezuka productions uh producing two apiece so this time around things are a little bit more different it seems that when you kind of you know put on too many works at the same time it does bring your average score down significantly lower wit studio that season uh I mean, only averaging a 6.285 that is um that is unheard of for wit studio because you know we we always hold wit studio in high regard but that doesn't mean that everything they do is going to be a heavy hitter that season they were also tasked with not just working on like you know other stuff behind the scenes uh but one of the main series they did was the Treasure Chest of Courage uh, for uh, Osama ranking uh, or yep. ranking of kings. The spinoff, right? Yep. That you were kind of lukewarm about. Your, you weren't I like... Was, I was okay. Yeah. 
but which is a far cry from the main series, right? But the lowest scoring anime of that season, Kizuna no Alil, was also co-produced by Wit Studio. So whether or not it was mainly Signal MD or Wit Studio taking the realms or what taking the the reins or whatnot, we we can't really come to that kind of conclusion because you don't have the information. But Wit Studio unfortunately was one of the underperformers of when, uh, spring 2023. JC staff and Leiden films under your hand. Averaging around a 7.28 and a 7.35, respectively, and working on multiple projects during that season. That was, uh, I, I'd say, yeah, I, those were probably the only two. Maybe you can throw in the like, Gatizuka Productions, but generally, like, JC staff are known to work on a lot of stuff per season. So, like, yeah, they they are known for, um, at the, and within the same breath, making probably the worst season sequel called one punch man season two but within that same breath produced probably one of the hypest shows that i love called um a certain ma- uh scientific railgun uh, as well as like other shows that are actually really good yeah. so there are like a mixed bag in the grand scheme of things yeah so shinny animation was the one that was responsible for working dangers of my heart uh ufo table with their swordsmith village arc um uh, or demon slayer that's where I also feel like it was a bit disappointing because Demon Slayer is always like top ten or like like top three, right? And yes, it is the second best performing of Spring twenty twenty three, but it is like vastly inferior compared to Dogokobo's Oshinoko, like an eight point seven one versus an eight point two eight. Nothing to laugh at for Yufa Table, but you 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 would imagine that's a kind of low score for a Demon Slayer arc. Yeah, and I, I, I also feel that there is a lot of hype and shine that is taken away from Demon Slayer because of its tried and true, very well produced, and extremely competent adaptation. So there's no surprise, and I don't think there is anything that I would say that is very bad at all about the Demon Slayer adaptation. But... Don't forget, within that same breath, you have three kind of viral hitters of different sorts. You have Oshinoko that is probably... I cannot underplay how important the hype and the virality of Doga Kobo's massive 90-minute episode one. I mean, you have names like... Sorry, you have, Wit, you have names like Wit Studio, Uvo Table, Production IG, PA Works, MAPPA, Madhouse... A1 Pictures here as well. You wouldn't imagine Doga Kobo to be the studio that's topping the charts, but they did an amazing job. I mean, when Oshinoko. we talked about Oshinoko, we were very hesitant about how they would perform at that time when we did, I think, the ASAP, right? But then they come out with an hour and a half long fucking premiere. And that just fucking changed everything. Yeah, because we're worried about pacing. We're worried about a lot of things. So it turns out, you know what? You just have it all in one go. I guess that. And and then Madhouse later on proved that formula is tried and true. Uh, I also think that Studio Kafka, uh, the season two finale, quote unquote, because it turns out there's a second part, right? But I think everyone got blue balled by the mid season uh, cliffhanger, which I get. Uh, so I can't fault you, but I also feel like it's a bit unwarranted. Yeah, Magus's Bride was doing really well, and then it was now, above an eight, and I then mean, it dropped all the way to now like a seven point seven five, which like, is still like very good. But it, it could have been much higher had they not had that cliffhanger. Which again, it, you, you can't do anything to prevent that. Uh, so yeah, other usual spe- suspects. I mean, Mappa doing really really well there. Madhouse still keeping consistent. You know, a high seven uh, for their production scores. Uh, I think one that is like perennially known to be like eh, i'm not surprised that they're down there passione yes it was a co-production with studio lings but a 6.7 like i wouldn't have suspected anything else for uh, for passione and another thing as well uh you might notice that there is a uh there's a studio on here called studio palette um that has nothing to do with uh, a good anime palette unfortunately uh we are not wait respons- what do you mean unfortunately well uh, wait, wait. Are, do they do good or bad? 
they had a six point seven. Yeah, they uh they are dead to us. We don't know anything about them. Yeah, they, they are responsible for making kamikatsu, working for God in a godless world. They are no way affiliated with uh Jason and William, and well as the Good Anime Palette podcast, as well as his branding. Yep. Um, OLM as well, six point nine four. Not an amazing score. Um, but again, like. It, it's it's hard to see them continuously doing really really well every season. Uh, they've had some hitters. They haven't had like the best of luck all the time. Uh, another one that was uh, you know I think one that we might want to sort of give a little bit of a mention to is um, again like we've talked about it before, but I'm just glad to see Madhouse is doing well mm, with like, right, and especially Madhouse doing something that isn't like action oriented. I mean, we know that, you know, Fjerden was, was fucking amazing. Right. Madhouse did that, too. But and this is about um, video games. Yep. Uh, my love story with Yamada Kunet level 999, which uh, we, you and I both quite like, actually. Uh, so I think it's, it's sometimes it may look odd from an outsider's perspective how all of a sudden MAPPA, who's known for JJK, is doing a campfire cooking isekai. But, hey, sometimes either the studio has other you know teams that does different projects or are focused on different genres as well as sometimes as maybe a creative industry you kind of want to not necessarily always do the same thing yeah i think one of the robberies of this season though has to go to Leiden films not so much for them stealing like good scores or whatnot it's more because they should have been much higher they were responsible for making Insomniac's After School, sitting at an 8.02, a phenomenal show. Really, really like it. But unfortunately, that season, they were also responsible for doing The Legendary Hero is Dead, which I thought was garbage. Um, so that's what brought their score down yeah. to a 7.35 average. Um, look, I'm not going to like you know knock on them for doing uh, Legendary Hero is Dead. Um, I just give them props because Insomniac's After School was fluffy and cute and comfy. Yeah, I, I I really like Insomniacs after school, especially that the vibe that they go for is more, I mean, it's about like being an insomniac, right? It's more calming, very soothing, and I love the lo-fi music. It's dope as hell. Yeah. But I just feel that this season is, personally speaking, very odd. What, in- what I feel with this season is that a lot of these series, right, uh, with the exception of for example, like Dangerous in My Heart. Um, a lot of the series started off really, really strong. Right? Yes. Like, for example, yes. like we, 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 Geek Toys is on here, and they were responsible for doing Dead Mount Death Play. Started you remember, off super strong. Do you remember Cheat Skill Isekai? We were we watched it, and we're like, hey, it's not the best show, but it was like a started out as a 7.5. I remember somewhere there, and it's now like a 6.35. Like, crazy massive difference in score. Yeah, there's also um, the Edomai, uh, Ed, uh, Edomai Elf. Oh, uh, right. The, the shut-in yeah. el- otaku the elf. The shrine maiden elf girl. Yeah. C2C occasionally does good stuff, but unfortunately this one, I think, I think like, it started off stronger. It was like a 7.5, and now it's like a 7.28. Yeah, and it could be a bit of, oh, these are the animes that are currently out as it airs, so then right off the bat a lot of people are hyped or they overinflate the score. So that's always possible, but yeah. when all of them are like that, then you expect it to be an adjustment, but you don't expect the adjustment difference to be so massive. Well, things like A Galaxy Next Door, Mashal. Um, like, I was surprised with both of those. The, the Konosuba one as well. Like, yep. They all started off good, and then now they're kind of like middling. So I mean, Tony Kawa, 7.58? Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. I don't think that score is fair, and I don't think it's that bad either. But I also feel that this is the season of very weird uh high expectations but low execution in the end i think with well, the exception of only two right now which i would say are oshinoko and dangers in my heart like you can say whatever you want about demon slayer being amazing but like i feel this is this is one of their weaker seasons um just because like dude like entertainment district arc the fucking mugen train the first season all three of those were high buzz fuck and now it's like you don't really hear a whole lot of people talking about demon slayer you know yes the anime is still running and the manga has been done a long time ago maybe that's why it's losing a bit of steam but again it's like let's not forget like how much of a storm 
like fucking Demon Slayer kicked up. The fact that like it was the only manga series that would consistently outsell One Piece. Yeah, and I think th- even we got so annoyed at hearing, oh, Demon Slayer charting the New York Times bestseller list, or um, what's that? Uh, the Japanese stats one that starts with O, Oricon. Oricon. Yeah, like. I'm not trying to dismiss the success of Demon Slayer as a property as well as the UFO table adaptation. But when you hear that new story of, oh, it's breaking another record, it's another week streak of continuing that record, there is going to be this animosity that develops in the community that are either doing it out of spite or legitimately or, you know, anti, what do you call it, mainstream, yeah. like contrarians. So then there's always going to be haters, essentially, at the end of the day. But to me, of all the things that aired that we watched and consumed, there were two that, actually one that we did not consume, that was really surprising and one that is really sad. The surprising one was Birdie Wing Season 2. Yeah, I think having an announcement of Season 2 was, first of all, crazy. Apparently, everyone that watched it is like a very staunch supporter of it. I don't know how true it is in my eyes in terms of the show because i haven't watched it so i'm not dismissing it i just don't know maybe i'll watch it at some point but it's not necessarily on like the top of my list but one thing that i think you and i will we kind of went off on a rant about was my home hero bro yeah that was so sad that it happened and within the first episode we just knew what the fuck they have they dropped missed. the ball. Yeah, exactly. They dropped the ball. I wouldn't give him the 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 loser of the season. It has to go. to I think it's the tragedy. Yeah, tragedy. Uh, tra- tra- tragedy. Yeah. Thank you. I just had it. Yeah, but I mean, no other winner really than Doko Kobo. Right, like you can make it. You can make uh, an argument for Shinya Animation with Dangers in My Heart, but it did not start off strong. It only picked up speed much later on, and now it's like really kicking off. But that's for a later season to talk yeah, about. Yeah, and right? don't forget that. Spotify for Doga Kobo's OP for Yasa Boy yeah. is like insane. I think there was an article they did like 500 million streams or something. It's like crazy. Yeah. So that wraps up spring 2023. We now move into the hot, hot summer of summer 2023. This time around, even fewer shows, 46 across the whole season. Um, and unfortunately, the score just keeps dropping. It is now a average score of 7.091 across all 46 series, six of which were 8, point, 8 to 8.99. But this is where things kind of take a bad turn because now we actually have more shows that rank in the 6 to 6.99 than the 7.799. Uh, and we also have our first series that scored below a five and no surprise is it is fully coolie grunge we've ragged on fully coolie for the longest time uh, it's not to say that like we we hate it or anything it's just we really have no opinion of it it just doesn't vibe with us we don't really want to talk about it because neither of us really care for the series and it also seems that the fans don't care for the new shit either so i i guess that the, the announcement from the director over at uh, Adult Swim. Was it Adult Swim that said it? Yes, yeah. Because yeah. like, yeah. they, they bought the license. Yeah, they were like, yeah, we're not doing this shit anymore. Like, hey, fine, get rid of it. Yep. And this was I around the time before, I think, Shoegaze came out? Or was it after Shoegaze came out? Do you remember? Uh, Yes. I, I, I'll, I'll double Sh- check. Shoegaze is coming up soon. Yeah. Yeah. Shoegaze, but, as, as in, like, in, in discussion. Right, but the new story, do you remember roughly? Like, I can double check, but... I think the newest one is Shoegaze. I think Grunge came out before Shoegaze. Yeah, but uh, the news of the guy saying, like, oh, yeah, we're done. Yeah, Does that... That, that came out shortly after um, Shoegaze had premiered. Yeah. Yeah, not great. Uh, in, in in some happier uh, happier notes, uh, Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2, the highest scoring anime of, uh, of summer 2023, with an 8.89. Very, very strong. I think it's even higher than Jujutsu Zero, I think. Yeah, so, um, yeah, MAPPA, still doing MAPPA things. Um, in terms of the amount of studios that were doing multi-productions, we had, I think, uh... Well, we had like eight, eight studios. Those were Axis, Studio Kokumi, OLM, Kimena Citrus, Silverlink, JC Staff again with three, Gohans, uh, and Lighten Films. I feel really bad with 
uh, the girl I like forgot her glasses because I, I was kind of repping that show and I just it became kind of mid. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 you know, just I don't know. I just I, I I feel bad about it. As in, like it it could have been better. I think. Yeah. So in this season, we had um, Mappa producing JJK season two. We also had uh, Piero continuing its crazy bleach train. Uh, so that one was sitting at an eight point seven one. Uh, then we had uh, Mushoku Tensei with uh, eight point three. The one before that with Bones. It was it was Bones. That one was um, the fifth season of Bungo Stray Dogs, right? Yeah. Yeah. So no brainer there. So the top five. Uh, this is the interesting thing. The top five are Mappa, Piero, Bones, Studio Bind, and Zanzigan. Who the fuck are Zanzigan? I had never heard of this studio before. Actually, okay, no, I have, but it's also like, I can't name a production at the top of my head that was done by Studio Zanzigan. Sitting at an 8.25. Yeah, Cloverworks is there, but they don't, make, they don't crack the top five. Like, Zanzigan's one outperforms. Which one is it? Hold on a second. That should, that's not correct. It's not Sense again. It is, is it Sense again? Yeah. Oh my god. Bang dreams. It's my go. So, uh, just so that we are clear, Mappa number one made uh, Jujutsu Kaisen season two, Piero, uh, Bleach, A Thousand Year Blood War, The Separation, uh, is second place with eight point seven one. Bungo Straight Dogs by Studio Bones. Uh, with a score of 8.66. And uh, Mashoko Tensei, Studio Bind, Jolly's Reincarnation Season 2. Am I, I'm reading that right, right? Yep. 8.30. Uh, and I guess uh, fifth place is Bang, Dream, It's My Go by Studio Zanz again. Mixed media because it's, you know, idle stuff. Uh, let me check what they're up to. Ooh. Yeah. All... Idle stuff for the most part. Okay, so I guess that's why they're scoring really high. Um, unfortunately, Horror Mia Peace could not get a top five spot for Cloverworks, but this is where we start seeing some interesting names here. Bug Films with Zomb 100, Lapin Track, which nobody really heard of, but they had a pretty interesting series, uh, which... Uh, I the they... best string of words that I can put together, Undead Girl Murder Farce. The fuck does that title mean? Well, obviously, I, I know, but it's just a really interesting show that came out of nowhere, really, for a lot of people. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm picking up uh, the speed again as well. You know, Dark with, Gathering. Dark Gathering was good. Uh, and then to me, probably the most pleasantly surprised one is My Happy Marriage, Kanama Citrus. So they did all right. Overall, they didn't do amazing, but you have to give them props for doing uh, Happy Marriage. Go Hands was the other one because they notoriously make some pretty shitty anime. I mean, uh, I think the girl I like forgot her glasses was the most uh, recent one up, but then the one before uh, that we're talking about now is the one that actually we both like. Yeah, the mascot mask yeah. is depressed again today. Which, again, it, it when shows that are done by studios are so swingy. I mean, JC Staff being probably one of the more egregious of 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 that ilk it makes sense if you are jc staff in my opinion yeah. because you are so massive in size that you're not just going to do one you're going to do like a lot so for mappa to have that kind of consistency is kind of really crazy but then when you hear stories of them being overworked that goes without saying and as unsurprising right yeah. I think the loser for this season, unfortunately, like, look, you're going to see things like Maho Film, Actus, Ilka, maybe even Studio 3 Hertz, which they perennially make only high sixes. It hasn't, I haven't seen anything crazy out of Studio 3 Hertz in a while. But I think the one that was a bit disappointing was Madhouse because they were on a pretty steady train of mid to high sevens, and then they dropped the gene of AI. I. I, 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 we watched the first episode. My God, it it was a horrendous production. I, I I don't know, at least from a consumer standpoint, why anyone would like this show. Yeah, M maybe it gets better. I mean, I I always say that in like 
defense of you know playing devil's advocate, but I have no fucking clue, and I don't would I would never find out. Yeah, uh, I guess is it that straightforward to give winner of summer twenty twenty three to Mappa? Maybe a shout out to Pierre. I mean, it, it's hard to give a shout out to either Mappa or Pierre or even Bones because it's like you know that Bungo Stray Dogs, you know that Jujutsu Kaisen as well as Bleach are going to do well. So would it be fair to give it to Zen's again? For Bang Dream, even though it's like it gets the inflated score of being an idol show, like MVP, but not the winner. Is that what you're saying? Like the most, uh, you as in of summer 2023, right? You're saying yeah. like the one that in my mind is the most valuable, right? Yeah, it would be to be honest, my happy marriage for me personally, mm. just because it's what I like and enjoy. It was also a very surprising uh, showing, and uh, it did look really well made. So uh, that to me is the most standout one of that season. Probably not the most best, critically speaking, if I'm being objective about it, but, you know. What about Studio? Which do you think is the the one that, like, you're like, yeah, no, they did, they did good work. Look, JC Staff, 7.27 average across three series. Not bad. But it wasn't, like, amazing compared to the the previous showing that they had in spring 2023. I don't know if there was like a studio that I would say is a hundred percent like winners. It also it kind of reflects why like the score, the average score across the seasons seem to be dropping. It's like the, the heavy hitters, you know, they're going to hit right. Like horror a piece, Jutsu Kaisen season two, uh, Bungo Street Dog season five, bleach doesn't your blood war, whatever arc or season it's in. Like, you know those are going to be doing good. It's the ones that are like sitting at the sevens and sixes that are like, ooh, I, and and the fact there were so few shows, only forty six. This is the fewest amount of series you've had in the season last year. I I, I think there's the it is the COVID issue, but you also have to understand that I'm actually quite curious to see if there is any viewership numbers that. I mean, it's impossible because you're trying to communicate between all these different streaming platforms and broadcast TV in multiple countries and whatnot, right? But during this time, uh, and I'm sure, Will, you would agree, uh, video game sales, people who watch streaming, as well as just a huge amount of employment in the tech industry is massively increased during COVID times, right? And to see that uh maybe their the numbers are skewed more on the lower side but maybe they're in terms of the number of people watching and again i have no evidence of this i'm just maybe that factored in what the amount of layoffs that we had during the the middle of last year yeah i i would i would suspect that wouldn't you have more time to consume anime when at the very least if you're doing remote work and you're stuck indoors it, it, it sounds like a very simple assumption it's like oh i lost my job at facebook was it all comes razor the yeah. most this... I, I guess i'm gonna go watch with shuka tensei now it's like <laughs> but it's it, it, just it, minus the reincarnation there, there, part, there might right? be some correlation they are jobless as fuck yeah so um yeah um i i think just in general it's like i think most people they just put their attention into the usual suspects right like jutsu kaisen bleach Go Stray Dogs, Jobless Reincarnation, yeah. and, and surprisingly as well with Psalm 100. Very, very strong show. It, may, it I think it was supposed to be an 8 and up, but it ended up being like a 7.93, 9.92. Uh, due to delay. Yeah. And I don't know if there's any evidence of the live action airing around the same time cannibalizing it. I don't know, but at least you and I have that uh, question at least, yeah, right? It would it would it wouldn't be like the reason why it didn't perform as well as it should. It's I mean, the delay. It, yeah, it's the Uncle Isekai syndrome, or a lot, or like the near automata syndrome. It is unfortunate that I think it's only airing like like mid December of 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 the year. Yep. So it's pretty far away. I would say though, quick uh, thing, um, the loser. I mean, do we really want to be a bummer and say, like, things that I was really saddened by? Sure. Go for it. I mean, you did it before with... Um, yeah, got to keep it consistent, right? Yeah. Okay. So, my biggest loser, or the most things that I'm actually the most disappointed by, is the fact that a lot of shows that... Wait, am I even looking at the right tab? Shit. Okay, yeah. Summer 2023. 
Uh, first of all, Rooney Kenshin. I grew up with Rooney Kenshin, old school Rooney Kenshin, right? Yeah. So, but I don't think it was a bad adaptation. There was just. I like, think it's over expectation. Yeah, I mean, or people you, just pining for the original, not wanting to see anything new, right? Like it, it people just are going to have passionate feelings about how the original came out. But probably the worst case, the worst case, of bringing the old alive again, is the best naming convention for a season two sequel I have ever heard called. The Devil is a Part-Timer Season 2 Bracket Sequel. To this date, still ranked at a 6.66. The Devil is truly among us. Hey, we talk about uh, mal users inflating or manipulating scores. But I have to admit, guys, y'all done good this time around. Yeah. We move on now to the final season of 2023, Fall. Massive explosion in the amount of series that came out. 63. Three, the highest amount across 2023. However, it also had the lowest average score of 7.047. There was one show, I think y'all already know which one it is, that was a 9 and up, that being Fieren, uh, but the lowest one was Kawagoe Boys Sing at a 5.44. So very mid-heavy. So there was one series that was a 9 and up, 5 there across 5 to 5, uh, 8, 8 to 8.99, but 50 shows that were between 6 and 7.99. Now, there are more shows that were 7 and 7.99 versus 6, 6, and 6, 6 to 6.99, but even then, right? Like, this, it felt like maybe it was also, like, in terms of, like, just looking at the numbers, an average season. But you also have to factor in that there were a lot of series. 63 series. That's a yeah. fuck ton. We went from, I think, 51 in winter or somewhere in the 50s like, and was, then it, high 40s. It was 54, 48, 46, and then now straight up to 63. And if you look at IRL life events, that's when kind of everyone was not only over COVID, but also a lot of the floodgates have uh, been opened up in terms of the production site being able to go back to work in a studio. And I guess a lot of animes that got delayed, probably even stuff that we didn't know got delayed, all got pushed out the door at the same time because they have to get it out by the end of the year. A total of 61 studios produced those 63 shows. And everyone always only did one show, I yeah, guess. Most, but there, there were some co-productions. Uh, not that many. Uh, there was like maybe only one or two studios that actually did uh, two or maybe a few on their own. Uh, Project Number Nine did three. A right. One did two. Da Media. There were a lot of studios that were doing uh, double productions. But well, again, I think that one thing that we should note is um, with Studio Man, they really take the L. They 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 got to stop working with Signal MD because whatever they work on with Signal MD, it just does not do well. Right, they had two productions. I think that season they had Spy Family, right? But they also coupled it with some other trash that somehow managed to bring their average score to a six point eight eight five. That is that is sad. Like what happened with what's going on with Wit? I think maybe maybe that's why they picked up the One Piece. Maybe that's why they need they need they need a W somewhere, man. Wit Studio was not doing hot. Hey, look, we can't abandon our little bro. Because he's family, but I, I, I don't know, guys. Like, I, 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 I messed up. I'm with Studio, uh, and I'm at fault for uh, helping out uh, Signal MD over here. I don't know, man. Um, who knows what the real reason behind it is? There probably is some, uh, like professional like relationship between the two studios that uh, Will and I are not aware of on the top of our head. But I have no idea why the two studios are collaborating to such a degree and then to consistently produce shows of a certain caliber or lack thereof, right? I, I have no idea, dude. Uh, I, I really want to know. but yeah. I can gladly say, though, that Madhouse took the W. Fjerden, you cannot ignore. It is the best scoring of all year and currently of all time. Yeah, and I think also within this season has an interesting phenomenon that we don't even see in general, which is 
a huge amount of double cur shows, not split cur shows, double cur shows. We're talking like Apothecary Diaries. We're talking about Fieren. We're talking about um, there was Shangri La Frontier. Shangri La Frontier, exactly. That are just like um. There's another one uh, under Unluck. That's also double uh, a, a double cur. Right, and I think also there were some surprisingly good shows that we didn't even spend time on, and it wasn't until after the cur aired. There's one that I wanted to talk about more in depth when we do a genre analysis, but the one that came to mind immediately looking at this list was Miggy and Dolly. Yeah, that's one of them, and the other one was uh, the the Four Sons, the one that had the first episode uh, subtitle issue with Crunchyroll, because they are above an eight now, and it was like a low sevens at one point. What, my boss is always goofy, or? No, no, no. Oh, that one, uh, Yuzuki-san. That's the one. Yeah, um, 7.9, sorry. Uh, it was almost an 8. Yeah, Yuzuki family's uh, four sons. That's the one. It started so poorly, and to have it kind of bounce back is very interesting and says a lot about how scores are scored by the users of my anime list, right? So interesting phenomenon for sure. Yeah, so now you don't really have too many of the usual suspects that are like, Oh, Captain Subasa is also thirty nine episodes. Yeah, that that one's a triple cur, damn. Yeah, um, but when you're looking at like the the top ranking uh, studios, right? Madhouse is number one. Uh, Toho Animation Studio because of their co production with OLM for Apothecary Diaries. That does mean that OLM was in the top five in terms of performing. I would give them the edge because they also worked on uh, other productions at the same time as well. Uh, Studio Nexus, they were the one that did Eminence and Shadow season two. Yeah, and uh, after season two, they announced a movie. So very typical fashion of how things, uh, you know, progress. They want a hey, the Mugen train really started everything, huh? Just, I mean, they're doing the fucking Rize arc as a movie for Chainsaw Man, and then Haikyuu is like, "Yo, I want to get in on this, guys!" Right? Uh, and then Slam Dunk is like, "Bro, you forgot who I am? Let me get in on this, guys." <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then Spike's family is like, "Yo, what if we uh?" Asked our friend Street Fighter to come in and join us on this uh, party. Yeah. Yeah, this is like, I guess that's the new thing. I actually want to talk to you about that for a potential BP. But, okay. But um, movies is the new thing now. Before that, it was split curves. Now, maybe it's double curves. Oh, don't and, and don't forget about hour, two hour long premieres as well, right? What a madhouse, madman thing to do. That's insane. Like, how crazy is that? Like, fucking Oshinoko is only an hour and a half. Okay, but to be fair to um, Oshinoko, it was a continuous 90 minutes, whereas uh, at least the way that Fieren was in uh, Netflix, or probably in a lot of places, it was four separate episodes released all at once. Then Apothecary Diaries is three episodes all at once. So, I- I'm shrugging my shoulders. You just can't hear me shrug my shoulders, yeah, listeners. So, topping the charts would be Madhouse, Toho Animation, Nexus, TMS Entertainment with the next iteration of their uh, Dr. Stone New World uh, series, uh, and then OLM. Uh, you know, they, they did good work, too. Cloverworks. Um, that's where I'm like, is, is, is the spy family train dying a bit now? I mean, the movie that is out in um, Japan, I think, right now, I think it's called White Christmas or something. Yeah, it's a yeah, 7.72, yeah. so... I you guess, but, but, a bit. It's, but it's a side story, right? It's not like related to the actual manga. Yeah, no, because it's in collaboration with Street Fighter. Yeah. I watched the trailer for that, by the way. I saw Street Fighter. I saw Chun Li fight Yor, bro. Yeah, I saw that too. That was kind of dope, but also, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. I don't know, man. But okay, sure. Yeah, I think that what what's really like weird about this season. And we keep saying about the previous season too, but like this one just keeps going down and down and down. It's like when you're topping, when you're, when you're looking at the ones that come out below the top five, right? You got C two C with Shankar La Frontier, Bibri Animation Studios. You got Shuka. Um, you also have Studio Kafka. That I think that was like the next part of um, Ancient Magus's Bride. Yep. They were production with um, uh, that's uh, und- yep. Und- yeah, und- yeah, you know, und- 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 Unluck. Yep. Comp Town, which was doing a co-production with Geek Toys. Geek Toys is a name that pops up very, very often. Uh, we're going to be hearing that a bit more uh, when we do our whole 2023 breakdown, not just the season, but the year itself. 
Uh, but I think we'll be covering that in the second half because we are running close to an hour now. And I think it would be good to give people the, like you know a little bit of a break. But just just looking at this, like you got Wit Studio all the way down again, six point eight eight five. Uh, quad still not doing well. They definitely aren't like uh, recovering from their Inukai uh, kerfuffle there. Um, who else is in here? Eight bit hasn't been doing very well since doing uh, uh, was it blue, not blue box? Um, what's the what's the what's the soccer anime they do again? Blue, oh blue lock. Yeah, that's it. If blue lock was great, but then everything else has come after it from eight bit has not been doing very very well. Uh, Shield Hero <laughs> season three says hello. Okay, fine. Uh, A one pictures. Two productions, 7.39. Uh, I think, again, one studio that we should probably take more notice of now. We have done it before, but Silverlink. They're, they're doing very well. Light and Films, still doing decently. Studio Kai, with two productions, averaging a 7.505. Who are they? Kai? Yeah, Studio Kai. Because I remember they did something with Hornets before. It was one of the... Um, no, that's Studio Kind Hornets. Yeah, no, you're right. Well, we did that for winter 2024. Yeah, was that seventh time loop or was that? Yeah, seventh time loop. Yeah, that's yeah. It. So, uh, I mean, to me, the most surprising studio to make an appearance in fall is Bibri Animation Studio, in my yeah. opinion. Uh, I don't, I was surprised at how. The reception of 100 Girlfriends is. Uh, I already have given it enough recognition and props, so I won't go off about it. But it is such a unexpected, weird side quest in the, in fall uh, 2023's journey that I did not expect, despite liking it. So, I mean, weirder things have happened in anime and manga, so... yeah. It's hard to pick a clear winner out of here because a, a lot of the studios that are at the top five did some really, really like crazy work. But I think you have to give it to Madhouse, right, for Fiedon. Oh, yeah, like no doubt, right? Like how can how can we deny the number one anime on the Mal database? Undisputed, undisputed right now, still. Then you factor in Madhouse, kind of having a res- like definitely now full no no comeback no recovery they're in it now they now are back in the zeitgeist kind of revival from their titan uh, like titanic kind of impression back then because a lot of them formed mappa later on right so insane everyone had doubts you and i included when they did fieren or announced it we were like what and then to our premiere what and now it's number one in everyone's topic discussion list for the year, yeah. period. What are your thoughts in terms of like the score degradation, the average score degradation across from fall, from winter 2023 through to fall? Because it was like a 7.167, slowly sliding down now to a 7.047. Like, do you think it's just like the, the, the dearth of anime there was in spring and summer and then like the overinflation of anime series in fall that kind of caused like this weird trend like the descending trend of the average anime score my speculation which again is purely speculation is covid is the uh, unsurprisingly guys like you you've heard it time and time and again but i think the pattern really does fit that trajectory especially when you talk about how in the fall uh, during that time, the borders have kind of opened up to allow worldwide travel in a big way. Uh, everyone was over COVID because they've been isolated, including people like our friends, my parents, your parents, that are just like, I need to get the fuck out of here. I don't care where, right? Then you take in from the anime production standpoint, everyone was bottlenecked due to COVID. Then once the floodgate opens, they overcompensate and oversaturate so to me it's kind of like when you have less shows on offer by default there are going to be winners and losers but maybe if you were to mix them in in like a more competitive season you and i will probably not even have that show in any 
uh, out of our mouths in anything related to anime and manga for that season. Yeah. So that's not to say that there aren't winners, genuine good shows each season. I just think that this year, 2023, we're talking about, is such a weird year because it's an appearance and disappearance of so many things that I think when we did 2022 or 2020, we actually did one for, I think, episode two, we did 2020. It was episode three, one of them. Yeah. Where this is so inconsistent, even though the trajectory is somewhat consistent yeah. to me. Winter, let me know. Uh, the year 2022, we saw like below sevens for winter and for summer. Spring and fall were above sevens. But with 2023, despite the scores like transcending, like, in the, like descending, they're all still above a seven. So I think on average, you could flip a coin and you would be watching a decent to a very good anime just as likely as you'd be watching something that was eh or complete garbage, which I think is like completely fine given the, the like you said, the erratic nature of how anime was produced and syndicated last year. I mean, if we, I'm just looking at 2022's lineup, right? And just counting offhand the number of high seven, so like 7.9 something to like eight pluses, there is just way more that I can like just see visually from a, from like just purely looking without making any judgment of the quality of the show, but just looking at the mouse score and how everyone seems to talk about it is there is, oh yeah, I see Bones are doing, um, you know, uh, My Hero Academia. I can see why that's an eight. Chainsaw Man, I can see that's why an eight. Blue Lock, you know, the first uh, Eminence and Shadow. Spice Family Part Two. Don't but forget the first Bleach as well. Exactly. So you're so all this hype like, kind of has like this narrative and story behind it, whereas the narrative and story that I can see in 2023, I just don't see it. I I I, I, can't, it's, I don't. It's, it's really unpredictable. Yeah. Like you you just, you just look at it. It's like, oh, I guess this trend is dying out now. But all of a sudden now everybody's trying to get movie adaptations for the next arc or next curve of anime or. Well, okay, I guess now, like, one and a half, two hour, like, straight off releases res- premieres are the norm now. So, um, yeah, it's... Because uh, yeah, how can you say a double cur, not a split cur, a double continuous cur is a good idea in modern anime production? Generally, it's a thing that people avoid because they get overworked or they want to, you know, gravitate to different jaw, like a different project, right? So split curs was a thing that we thought was going to be like a... a a trend and it, i think it certainly was and i think it certainly, I, I, was, it certainly so. is still then all of a sudden boom four or five shows double cur because i just we forgot seven deadly sins is a double cur so it's just like and Tsubasa was a triple cur yep then you within the same sentence has fieren but then you have so much other crap of course every season has crap but 2023 has to me the really good shows and the really bad shows, and then it just so happens to be the law of numbers it evens out towards the end. Yeah. It's just so jarring. Yeah. What we're going to do now then is... Sorry, I went on a rant. No, no, that's completely fine. We are now go, going to take a quick break. Uh, after the break, we're going to be breaking down the whole year of 2023, along with a few other small little bits and pieces in terms of, like, genres, in terms of, like, what was the best, what was the worst, and... One thing that we didn't do last time was also analyzing sources for adaptations uh, for 2023. So, uh, yeah, we'll get back to you right after this break. And we're back with the second half of episode 77. 77 or is it 76? It is 77. Yes, I got it correct. I shouldn't have second guessed myself. Anyways, we're going to go straight into the second half because uh, no more time wasting. We want to go over the overall summary of 2023, maybe do a bit of a genre breakdown, look at what was the best performing stuff, the worst performing stuff, and we'll also be looking at how studios were going about picking genres for adaptations along with sources for adaptations. So, 
let's go over 2023 as a whole. So we're putting together all the all the all the data for winter, spring, summer, and fall. Overall, 211 series came out in 2023, averaging at around a 7.1, yeah, so 7.106. Uh, so still only one series, which is Fjerden, being over a nine. I think it's uh, currently actually a number. It's actually a, a nine point one three, uh, but I had it as a nine point four when I was clicking the data. Only still one series, Fully Cooly Grunge, that came out at a four point seven, and uh, yeah, ninety three series, almost half of twenty twenty three were ranked seven to seven point nine. So I think that that sounds about right, right? Like when you're talking about an average score of seven point one zero six, the the spread of series is somewhat still consistent with how things have shown over the past couple of years. I mean, from an, a statistical perspective, it's not necessarily a bell curve, but when you look at how people usually rate animes on my anime list, uh, having a huge chunk, like the second highest chunk in the 6 to 6.99 range, is very normal. So I would say this is very normal of any given anime year. So, uh, seems to be okay, but how are we feeling about studios' performance? What is their report card? How are, are we going to get mad or at certain, you well, know, st- uh, certain kids? Certain kids? There were only a handful of studios that produced a, a series minimum every season. That was JC Staff, Leiden Films, OLM. Geek Toys of all studios, as well as Madhouse, and I think that's it. No Clover. Unfortunately, no Cloverworks. I think they just ran out of steam. Like Cloverworks, whilst they still managed to get a pretty good average, they actually only produced one series for uh, winter, one for summer, and one for fall. They skipped spring. Well, to to also be fair, to have one anime production every season is quite intense i think so oh sorry i actually made a mistake jc staff didn't actually produce one for fall they did however produce two winter three in spring and three in summer totaling eight total productions across 2023 Leiden films on the other hand did do manage to did manage to make one minimum every season so one for winter and then two each for spring summer and fall i think the also i also want to add here is When we're looking from an animation studio's perspective, having uh, the piece of the pie any given anime season of the year, the projects that are in talks while these shows are airing are like, I mean, I have no insider knowledge, but I would argue is kind of like almost like a year in advance minimum. Because the way that you want to do things is the moment that a project wraps up or ends, there's no lull, there's no stasis. If, uh, if if we don't assume that like all the staff goes on vacation or due to COVID complications or other kind of studio closure issues. So you want to keep the momentum and the ball rolling, right? So everything that is announced, you know, for this, for 2024 has already been done during this time in 2023. Yeah. They just haven't actually animated it or released it yet. So yeah. it's, it's just to bear that in mind, guys. Yeah. So in terms of like studios that are doing multi productions, I'd say that the clear winner, obviously here, there are actually uh there are actually three or maybe even four winners actually. JC Staff, Leiden Films, OLM, and Silverlink, with surprise fifth place for Geek Toys. Geek Toys, like I think with doing um whatchamacallit, with uh Zom one hundred. No no no, that's bug films. Geek Toys, what do they do? I'll have to check Death Mount? Oh, De- Dead Mount Death Play. Uh, both seasons, actually, yeah. Um, so, surprise being in the top five in terms of a multi-production studio of 2023. But, like, you can't look past how fucking good OLM, JC Staff, as well as, like, Latin Films are doing. Silverlink is in the discussion as well. I'm just surprised that Madhouse is not in the front-running position, on, like, in the retrospective of churning out so much stuff. Yeah. But what they did do was consistently produce at least one show. They had one in each season, winter, spring, summer, and fall. So they actually made four. They had four productions. The one you're putting right now is MAPPA. Oh. Yeah. 
Zero. So, Ma- right? so MAPPA didn't actually release anything in fall 2023. Right. But across their four series, no doubt, right? I mean, they did what? Fucking uh, JJK. JJK. They did um, uh, what's that one? The other one, the what? Paradise. Yes, that's the one. Yes. Hell's Paradise. They yes. were all over eights, right? So that's why across the four productions they had the average in 8.415, which is fucking insane. Yeah, then... Like, yes, it's MAPPA. Yes, there's, of, of course, overwork allegations and whatnot, but you can't help but see that they did not drop the ball with whatever they were doing. And they still are crowning achievements in... Oh, you forgot AOT, right? We forgot AOT, right? Oh, yeah, that was, that was also there, too. But it's kind of like, was it, like, uh, part three? What was it? <laughs> season... The, 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 the final, final season... season part three... No, nope. final season part season three part two, oh, fuck. finale part two, something like yeah. that. Sorry, I, the fact that we're like I hate it. I hate these name of conventions. Man. I, I, I fucking hate it too. Uh, God, Jesus Christ, what, what what is that? Anyways, um, but you can only blame one production. For fucking what? devils a part timer with their atrocious season two part two, but they can't even get that shit consistent with the Japan release as well. Listen, guys, no one, including the devil, is perfect, right? Yeah. So so if we're looking at just, like, overall, like, average score, Toho Animation was the top one with their Apothecary Diaries, which was a co-production with OLM. Piero, because they were doing Bleach, right? Like, 8.71. Bones, they had two, but that was because both of them were Bungo Stray Dogs. Then you had Nexus with uh, Eminence and Shadow. I think Mappa was, like... They were, they were on fire. Like four productions, not all seasons. It was two one one across winter, spring, and summer. Nothing in fall, but an eight point four one five across everything they did. That is that is consistency if I've ever seen it before. TMS Entertainment they were doing well too, but that's because they also had um, Doctor Stone. That that's always going to be a good time. So Toho essentially is the uh, who uh, their one production is Apothecary Diaries. Yes. Uh, Piero would be Bleach. Yep. Uh, Bones would be Bungo and Bungo and Bungo. Bungo Bungo. Yeah. For, for uh, season four, season five. Uh, Nexus would be Eminence and Shadow, and then Mappa. Well, uh, yeah. Let's not get into that. It's just a lot of shows. Yep. So, uh, one that I was actually uh surprised to see, uh, like in the top, right? Yeah. Like not so much in the top, but it's like, I think. We we were all very much caught by surprise with Dangers of My Heart, and if we just look at average score, Shin Anima- Animation produced the seventh best, like average score, even if it was only like one production. But Dangers of My Heart was really strong, eight point two three. Give him props. To me, the most uh, plain as day obvious thing is UFO Table only having one production, and it was it happens to be the lowest scoring Demon Slayer occur. Still, but I like the fact that UFO Table is like, yeah, I'm 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 gonna peace out and I'll come back later on with something. Uh, don't worry about it. Is like the biggest UFO Table thing I've ever I've ever heard ever. So yeah, um, I just. I do see a lot of co-productions, by the way. There's a lot. There's a lot of co-productions. And I don't think there was a lot even last year or the year before even. But do you think it's this is, again, like the COVID fallout? Just like studios being short-staffed or like just having like on-site like production issues where you can't go into work, but like maybe the studio is clear to go work? I have no idea. Like, okay, the, the most – I have no definitive kind of uh, – proof but i think it's a little bit of there's also a lot of studio closures right yep. and people getting laid off but at the same time anime is expanding there will probably be a, a, a lot of uh anime studio heads that are pressured and under the gun to be like yo you got to do this you got to do that now that covid is mostly done and dusted right there are also like yeah not just studio closures but also like studios being absorbed so for example like there actually is a breakdown between uh studio sunrise as well as sunrise beyond but as of earlier this year just last week uh studio sunrise beyond was actually absorbed by bandai nemco filmworks yeah and then after stripping all their assets they just basically shut down the studio you've uh corporate speak yeah. for basically uh get out of here get out yeah exactly right <laughs> it's like it's kind of like uh we uh did not uh, f- uh lay off people we are 
restructuring our company to the most appropriate size given the circumstances of yeah. the economic situation of the company. So it's just like, shut the fuck up. You know what you did. We all know what you did. Just say it, please. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um. Uh, so, like, I, what is your take on the co-production stuff? Like, do you think that's a good thing, bad thing, and why? Like that. I mean, I know it's a huge question to it's, ask it's you. It's probably a necessary thing, to be honest, because like we know that studios themselves aren't always like. Not everybody is a Mappa, right? Not everybody is an A One Pictures. Not everyone is a Kyo Annie, and you rarely ever see any of those three studios doing a co production, right? But it's because they have the amount of enough people to actually work on multiple. Dude, even like Bones has five sub studios. Right, like I, I didn't even knew that until I didn't even know that until today when you kind of talked about Studio A B C D E, and I was just like, "What?" They have a studio specifically for Bungo Stray Dogs. They that makes a, sense. They have a studio specifically for Eureka Seven and other shit. Right, like fucking um, Metallic Rouge was done by Studio E. Right, so like I, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna break down all the different sub studios they have there. It's just A B C D and E, um, and which ones they did, but. Let's just say that there are some studios that are set up to be able to do stuff on their own. And then there's some that just need a little bit of help, right? Like Silverlink did a co-production with Blade, right? Geek Toys did a co-production with Comptown. Kingdom of Citrus, two of the shows they produced last year were co-productions with two other companies, Gift Animation and Studio Jemmy. Uh, that was for like some weird like little like kids cartoon thing. I don't remember what it was called. Uh, it, was, it was like some sort of card game thing. I don't remember what it is. Uh, noir one? I don't. I, I can look it or up. Or card fight. I think there's card one. Card fight. Card yeah. fight Vanguard. I, yeah. yeah. Card fight Vanguard. That's kind of like a precure in the sense of like, it's like a area of anime and manga that Will and I have zero knowledge about. But it seems to keep showing up, keep having some sort of following. So, you know, hey. I, I'm confident in saying that... The, the stinker of the year has to go to Signal MD because they did two co productions with Wit Studio over the year, yet their overall average was a 5.783. They managed to sully the name of Wit Studio. I'm not blaming them solely. It could also be on Wit Studio's fault, too. But, like, I just don't think that that is the co-production duo you want to see for your anime yeah and even though it is conjecture and speculation to a certain degree uh when wit studio is on their lonesome self when they're doing solo um they're doing fine okay so when you are doing a certain way or performing a certain way and then a new ingredient gets mixed in and then things change it's very easy to assume, may not be the most accurate, but it's still relatively safe to assume that the new thing that came in affected the performance overall. Do you know what's actually crazy about Wood Studio for last year? They only had one production that they did on their own. That was in spring 2023. I forgot which one it was. But of the four, two of them were Card Kite, a uh, Card Fight Vanguard with Signal MD, and then one of them was a co production with Cloverworks for Spy Family part two season two or whatever it was um yeah uh wit did not do very well last year 6.595 or is that eight yeah 6.8585 they they dropped the ball last year there's hopes that you're going to be doing better this year but just just running off of what i see right now for 2023 yeesh not not looking good for uh not looking good for 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 wit studio um, you, you, you got to give props to Doga Kobo still, um, you know, three, um, productions, 7.53, but you know, one of them being Oshinoko and the other two kind of being somewhat, yeah, yeah. you know, but it's like, they, they put themselves on the map with Oshinoko. Um, another breakdown that I, I, I think, did, the, I, sorry, yeah, I, I think it. the thing about Doga Kobo that is the most useful in the long run, in the grand scheme of things. Because I think when we look at the numbers, it's very easy to make some assumptions, even if they're accurate or not, right? But I can at least say that Doga Kobo can handle a heavy hype IP with a lot of production value behind it, right? They may not necessarily win all the time, even with all the benefits and resources 
of a, a crazy IP or budget, right? It's also not their fault they release something that's supposed to be popular but comes out a season right after, you know, Dress Up Darling comes out. Right. However, you can at least say that, like, they have produced something of Oshinoko caliber that, to my knowledge, sounds really hard. But it's, it's one of the best ranked anime of 2023. And then a 90 minute premiere, and then have it all kind of do very well. Like, it's not an easy feat for any animation studio. So, I mean, if, let's not forget that there was a period of time when Oshinoko was the number one series of all time. And yep. then, like, the. You know, the brigade came in and is like, nope, we're not letting this happen. They haven't done it with Fjordan, but, you know, they, they definitely will come back in force in some time. I mean, when you said, like, oh, yo, you like, Jason, do you like that anime, My Senpai's Annoying? Oh, yeah, it's, it's decent. It's pretty good. Then, you know, that office, you know, workplace comedy. Oh, yeah, they're doing uh, Oshinoka. Be like, shut the fuck up. No. But I- I'm proven wrong. I'm glad I'm proven wrong. And if there is another hype property down the line in the future that Doe Kobo's doing, I will be very confident. Like, oh, yeah. They did Oshinoko. They they should be fine. Yeah. Um, another breakdown that we did last year was looking at studios that did multiple productions and see how they actually performed. So there were only there was only one studio, fucking, you know, Matt Lads at JC staff that did eight productions and they managed to have an average of uh of around four point uh, seven point four six. One studio, Leiden Films, did seven productions, seven point Three six six basically three three point six seven essentially. Uh, there were two studios that did six productions. Those being Silverlink and OLM, and they averaged around a seven point four three something like that. Um, so that's still pretty good. Two studios, on the other hand, though, did five productions, and their average was below a seven. It's like a six point eight. Four uh, no six studios did four productions. Averaging close to seven point four, then you had like studios that like did like yeah you had a lot of studios that did um, three productions, a lot more studios that did two productions, and then of course you had like the majority of them only doing one production. Yeah, because it's of scale, right? What what was interesting is like this actually turned out to be very top heavy. That if you were doing multiple productions, chances are you would also be averaging good mouse scores and i think it comes to the fact that like these are big studios right like jc staff Latin films olm silverlink uh mappa madhouse a1 pictures they all did really fucking good work then you also have like some studios like the ones like for example like geek toys and project number nine like understandably they're not the biggest names right Ge- geek toys with deadmon death play that still wasn't enough to get them like a very very high average they only just managed to scrape above a seven yeah so when you factor in the low scores that unfortunately project number nine had despite doing angel next door spoils me rotten yeah I, I think it also comes down to what kind of properties these studios are working on right like jc staff is always going to be getting some good stuff even if they don't do everything that well light and films they're they've been trusted with um tokyo revengers yeah I, I think one of the more important things that comparing the amount of studios that have done a certain number of anime productions per year, because it sounds kind of, well, what's the point of this number? However, I think it's actually very important because in a way it shows the if even if the size of a lot of studios, first of all, probably like a shit ton of uh anime studios that does one production which is like 68 actually 67 because let's be honest ufo table is like an enigma and an anomaly right yeah but the majority of these one production studios per year are probably very low in size so the resources or their reach might be like tough i mean i'll just name a couple of studios high in the sky is an actually name of a studio there was magic bus you met a company studio palettes NG, Gallup, Mont Blancs. Uh, oh, pictures. these are NFTs, right? These are cryptocurrencies you're talking about, right? Typhoon Graphics NFT, man. Yeah. <laughs> then you have Encourage Films, Bakken Records, Studio Hibari, Mila Pensi, Fugaku, Akatsuki, Kara, uh, Actus, New Deer. You're just saying Studio, words now. There's Studio Unend. 
Studio L'Esprit Hotline Yell. Oh, that's an energy drink, EVG, right? EVG, EVG, dude. They're doing like some charging shit for Tesla, right? Yeah, no. Oh, fucking, I don't know. But but so you might be saying, okay, I Jason, duh. Uh, smaller studios, they can't have the same output as like a mammoth studio, right? But to me, the more interesting, I guess, nuanced kind of observation is. When you are of a certain massive size, like let's take one of uh, the biggest or most well-known over like the span of anime and manga in general, JC Staff, right? They have been in existence for so long, just like Sunrise is, right? Or Toho. You would expect that they are running at a certain efficiency that is top tier. Because they, yeah. you know, their bid's gonna be at the top if like the, an anime is ready to be adapted and it's gonna be a good one. And then their production staff, like we tend to not know producers and their involvement, or you know, scheduling, uh, uh, and and, and like sorting out these types of minutia behind the scenes stuff. But it actually is massively important, and the only way to do that without a huge amount of whether it's inefficiency or uh, mistakes is to do it for a long period of time, build up that repertoire, build up that skill set. And surprise, surprise, a lot of the massive amounts of productions are also studios that are long lasting. Yeah. So because like we're they, talking studios that have been running for like well over two, maybe even three decades. Yeah. Like and Sunrise is old as fuck. Yeah. Yeah, sure. You can say Sunrise Beyond is like, well, that technically didn't work out but sure but not sunrise right sunrise beyond you could say is like a weird spin-off offshoot that just didn't pan out but it still got reabsorbed back in but if you're telling me that sunrise doesn't know how to budget or schedule an anime production i would be telling you that you just lost your mind yeah then you also have studios that tend to be more selective like look piero definitely got a lot of flack for some of the work they've done in the past which is why now they seem to Naruto. be only, yeah. Which is why they only seem to be doing Bleach, but it works well for them. Same with UFO Table. They don't need to do anything else outside of Demon Slayer or whatever movies they choose to come out with. Right? Uh, I mean, they're doing a uh, Fate Stream. F- no, that w- are they doing Fate Stream Fake or no? That one's going to be uh, by A One, I believe. I think you're right, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So it's not to say that like if you only do one production, it's going to be shit. No. Some of them can be a bit selective. Like they were productions, they only do one, maybe two a year, right? Uh, and Studio Orange does one every five, five years. Five. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? So the again, low production number doesn't is not the end all be all, but it could also very well be like, oh, we're prepping for the next year. Cause Cloverworks has that kind of pattern. They were making six series like in 2022, and then they only have three last year. Like, and two of them were no, they have four. But then like three of the stuff that they had done last year were co-productions. So it's 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 hard for them. Yeah, because it's Spy, Spy, Horimiya, and one of like the spinoff for Coma ones, right? Or something. No, it was the two um, Vanguard. Uh, no, the one that they did with Signal D. They did two with Signal D. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it, it's it's not always going to be like you see Wit Studio. It's going to be great because sometimes like Wit Studio is actually not a big studio. Wit's actually quite small. There's a reason why they've been handing off a lot of stuff over to Mappa. Right. They gave up on um, uh, AOT. AOT. They gave up on Villain Saga. Mm-hmm. Right. And then there's also like and then Studio Kafka took uh, Ancient Magus's Bride. Yep. 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 So it's it's not always going to be like, oh, once you see a studio, you know for a fact it's going to be great, right? And this is not to knock a wit studio. I think it's just that it's hard to keep things consistent when you have such a small team. In fact, I would say wit studio is very ballsy in doing that. Imagine handing off AOT to someone, anyone, and not holding on to that cash cow. Imagine, okay, you can say Ancient Magus is right of the examples that we have said is probably the least like hype show. But you're telling me you're going to give Vinland Saga away? You're fucking out of your mind. Imagine, but, okay, well, let's, let's look this way. Would you trade Ancient Magus's Bride, Vinland Saga, and Attack on Titan if it meant that you could remake One Piece? Oh, holy shit. Because that seems to be the direction we're going in with, <sighs> with, with Studio. You know what I mean? Like, what they're doing is incredibly ambitious and could really, like, leave them with egg on their face if they fuck it up. 
I am a more conservative and defensive and play it safe person. So I would definitely take three IPs over the biggest IP because I don't think that's a good idea. Attack on Titan, Vinland Saga, Age of Magus' Bride, all big properties, but none bigger than the One Piece. Yeah, no dispute there. I just think that putting all your eggs in one basket is very dangerous. It's, it's not necessarily the, uh, a bad decision. I just yeah. think it's very dangerous is all. Yeah. Despite all that, though, I still I still feel that Wit Studio was the dud of last uh, of last year like four productions only one was their own so, own sole contribution and still averaging like well below a seven um it sounds harsh but i think that's just the reality of it right they're probably like trying to put together a, a crack-ass team to be able to work on the one piece and whatever productions they got coming out for 2024 to me the biggest winner we're talking studio wise right yeah for me is madhouse undisputed like, I'm not even necessarily saying, oh, because Fieren is number one on my anime list. It is more of, to me, the narrative and the story of what Madhouse used to be if we go back in time to episode 11 of the GAP podcast and how we felt about the kind of the breaking up of MAPPA then eventually, no, sorry, the breaking up of Madhouse that eventually formed MAPPA, right? With And then Redline and how our opinions on it is. And uh, remember when I used to not shut up about Sunny Boy yeah. for some reason? Because it's like, where did that come from, from Madhouse? And where did Madhouse come from? Then now, there is no question that Madhouse is back. Like You might be like, oh, well, what about MAPPA then, right? They're like an averaging 8.415. But yeah, but that's because they had two seasons of Jujutsu Kaisen, one season of Hell's Paradise, as well as whatever fucking season it was of AOT. And don't forget that MAPPA was formed because Madhouse is kind of like like fractured, like fractured up, right? So if you go by that uh, assumption, all the good talent went to MAPPA. So what does Madhouse had left? And for the longest time, they were just either doing one or a couple of things here and there, or not doing anything. Oh, yeah. So, Don't forget they also did uh, Campfire Cooking, too. That was the other one, too. That's what kind of dragged down their average. But, Ma- I mean, MAPPA is going to do good stuff. It's the story of the revitalization of Madhouse, which is why, like, yo, props to them. They outperformed JC Staff, Leiden Films, OLM, as well as Silverlink. The only one they weren't really able to outperform was MAPPA, but uh, what are you going to do? Yeah, it's kind of like you, your other sibling is is taking the shine, but you are no slouch either now. So I think that's okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm happy to give the winner of 2023 to Madhouse. And unfortunately, the not-so-good award to uh, Wit Studio. It's It sounds harsh, but I have, I have higher hopes for them in the coming year. I'm just trying to think, like, what would be my... Uh, like uh, op- like polar opposite MVP, like the worst performing in my opinion, right? Um, it's really difficult now that I think about it. Project number nine. Uh, I I don't think project number nine is always very good in general. Whenever I so hear, it's it's, it's, it's kind of hard to give them that award because it's like they consistently make bad stuff. Minus Angel Next Door swells me wrong. I mean, whenever we look at like oh the next anime season. And then we go, oh, this anime's done my project number nine. We always like look at each other being like, oh, God, here we go again. How many disappointments have we had from project number nine? Yeah. Um, again, I, I don't know. Uh, Maybe just leave it at that then. Yeah, I think so. Rather than me just keep staring at the screen trying to find something. Right. We now move into the genre breakdown of 2023. This one was fucking annoying to do but i'm glad i finished it in the end so we're going by the mal tags um so the, so it's not the themes but the genre so things like reincarnation classroom workplace those kinds of things will not be analyzed because i'm not fucking doing that yeah that yeah right? don't so i don't want you to do that the, the, the tags that we're going to go with are action adventure i hate to put avant-garde because it doesn't even belong there but yeah uh there was no boys love so we're not gonna go over that comedy drama fantasy 
very little girls love, but we'll still talk about that. Uh, Gourmet only had one, but yeah, that was Campfire Cooking. That was the only one that was uh, there last year. Uh, horror, uh, mystery, romance, sci-fi, slice of life, sports, supernatural, as well as suspense. And right off the bat, there's one thing that is insane to me. The fact that there were only nine out of 211 series last year that had the slice of life tag on it. That was insane. I need to check the mal to see what was shown. Okay, so three in winter, zero in spring, zero in summer, and six in fall. So I need to I need to double back and and, and double check. Like what the hell came? I'm not saying I don't believe you. In fact, it's more like I, Mal, I, what did I, you do, Mal? I had to keep checking. I had to keep looking every single day just to be like, something's not right. There's, not, there's no way there's this little slice of life. I mean, I'm going to keep it a buck, Will. You and I both have discussions on air, off air, about how dumb and unintuitive like genre, tag, uh theme oh, whatever you know we're, that- we're, we're gonna get into that when we talk about the best and worst of 2023 because there's gonna be some interesting observations there but slice of life only nine it, it, it's it's kind of insane that like we're even talking about this being like one of the fewest tags across 211 uh, can you do me a favor will uh, do you have the number of total animes that were uh considered for our anime retrospective like the total number of productions 211 so two out of 211 shows, only nine had the tag Slice of Life. <laughs> this is even more absurd. I can't fucking believe this. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. No, no, no shit. The top three were fantasy, action, and comedy. Right? Like, those are the top three. But, like, fantasy by far. Like, almost half of the productions had the word fantasy as a tag for that specific series. Now, remember, not all series only have one tag. Some of them could have multiple of them. Yeah, that's why, like, how could... Slice of life not be used. It's insane. It's really, really weird. Um, yeah, so action had 78 uh, tags, uh, and then comedy came in third with 67. Fifth, uh, the fourth was, I believe, uh, romance, and adventure was third. So these are like, you, like, no shit, right? Those are always going to be like the top used tags for any genre of anime. I mean, yeah, shonen, right? What's more interesting, on the other hand, though, is the score breakdowns for each genre. So whilst fantasy was number one in terms of how many productions there were, it wasn't the highest scoring in terms of the amount of average scores it had. Uh, So it was just over a 7, 7 7.0445. So you would have some decent times watching fantasy series, but it wasn't always going to be the best time. Um there were a few things I had to cut out because, like, for example, I couldn't do a average score for Gourmet because it was only one tag across all 211, that being um, Campfire Cooking. Uh, it's kind of hard to do sports as well because most of it was, like, Captain Subasa and a bunch of other shit. Um, there was also Uma Musume, Pretty Derby. Uh, so that's why, like, in terms of, like, average sports is a 7.47. Supernatural, this is where it was kind of weird. Supernatural only showed up 21 times. So, like, one-tenth of the series had the Supernatural tag, but it was the highest-scoring genre tag. No, sorry, the second-highest-scoring uh, genre tag, number one being Mystery. So I want to provide a live uh, update on the situation on how my anime list defines what is considered a slice-of-life anime. And I'm going to read word for word, Okay. Slice of life stories are focused on a seemingly random and mundane period of the main character's lives. The abundance, no, the absence of a central plot to carry the story towards a charted destination means slice of life story frequently lacks overarching conflict and resolution. While life is not without conflict and slice of life neither, here conflict appears and dissipates seemingly at will without a specific narrative to enforce it. Now, they are add an uh like kind of like a, a little well, explanation yeah. because you and i will probably say well what about like comedy romance drama because skip and yeah. loafer is fucking drama bro yeah yeah it's, yeah so it's not a slice of life what the fuck okay but they say here uh quoting the second paragraph 
slow story pacing or episodic storytelling does not equal slice of life. Drama slash romance stories can be slow and soft while maintaining a central plot of human relationships and struggles. Comedy stories may lack progress and have mundane settings, but they have narrative focused on eliciting laughter rather than amusing moments happening naturally. Thus, Slice of Life is incompatible with comedy, drama, and romance by definition. Yep. Slice of Life has to be Slice of Life on its own. Now, one thing that you uh, mentioned as well was that um, lack of conflict, right? Is it surprising that we had COVID and also two massive wars going on last year? Maybe that's why we only had nine slice of lives. People were just not having a chill time. Maybe that's why action and fantasy were so fucking high up because people just did not want to live in this world anymore. I I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm I just like, yeah. I'm speechless. But okay. By the way, where's performing? Um, I'm not even including avant-garde in this because it just means it was just weird ass shit. And that's why it has a 5.79 average. Yeah, but I, the, I think that's kind of a, a, like a, a non-issue, the right? The worst performing genre tag was sci-fi. At a six point five nine, basically a five point a six point six. Mm. There was by far, and there, there weren't. There, there were actually more than uh, supernatural. It was it was twenty five, so just over ten percent of anime uh, that came out last year had the tag sci fi on it. So if I remember, like just without like, try, I'm trying to recall, Heavenly Delusions is sci fi, right? Gene of AI. But yeah, exactly. That's what I mean, right? It is so massive in quality. And then when you are one of uh, a few sci-fi shows, comparatively to you know fantasy, for example, each like dud or each win is a big deal. Yeah. So the average performance for all these genres it shows a bit, but what I wanted to show you was the next one, which was the best and worst of each category, because that's gonna show you the fuckery that goes behind how people put genre tags on anime okay, on anime. Here we go. Here we go. So. The best performing, remember, these are the best for each season, as long as along with the worst and overall. And they're breaking these down according to the genre. So, for action, the best of winter 2023 was Vinland Saga. And then I'm just going to say the winners for each season, right? Vinland Saga Season 2, Demon Slayer, Swordsmith, The Village Arc, JJK Season 2, Eminence in Shadow, with JJK Season 2 being the best overall. The worst was KJ Files Season 2, Marginal Service, Fully Kali Grunge, and Kami, uh, Kami Arabi, uh, with Fully Kali Grunge being the worst. Adventure, Villain Saga again, followed by Heavenly Delusions, Atelier Riza, uh, Ever Darkness, and Secret Hideout, and then, uh, no, sorry, no, Bleach, Thousand Year Blood War, uh, Separation, and Fieren Beyond Journey's End, with Fieren being the number one adventure. Fruit of Evolution was the worst. And in that category, you also had Summon to Another World for a second time, Atelier Riza, and Butarava. Comedy, you had Buddy Daddies, Dangers in My Heart, Zom 100, and Eminence in Shadow Season 2, with Eminence in Shadow being the best comedy. Right, okay. Right. Kai was the worst. But would you consider Eminence in Shadow to be, like, a comedy? I mean, kind of. Let's move on, then. Fantasy, Don Machi Season 4, Demon Slayer, Swordsmith Arc. Uh, you also had uh, Jutsu Kaisen Season 2, and Fieren. Fieren won number one. Flaglia, the Flagboy one, I think, uh, was the worst. Uh, it's a fantasy? Okay, okay, hey, hey. I know, okay. it has the tag. Hey, no problem, no, oh, all good, all good, all good. I- I'm not against you, I'm with you here. It's hard to do horror because there was only really like one season that had horror. That was Psalm 100 uh, being the Not best Dark one. Dark Gathering? Dark Gathering was in the middle. It was, it was a 7.8. Mm. Uh, and then Yami Shibai 11 was 5.75. Mystery. But Yami Shibai is a bit. Yeah. The, no, yeah. That, let's not talk about that one. Yeah. Bungo Stray Dogs Season 4. Heavenly Delusion was also the worst in uh, the the spring 2023 because it was the only mystery show that came out of that season. It's first and last place, right? Yeah, Yeah. Bungo Street Dogs season five. So you can see Bungo Street Dogs is going to win this one. And no, it's not. 
Apothecary Diaries is actually not only the best of, win- of, of fall 2023, but also the best of the year. Now, what's interesting as well is that within the mystery for uh, for for uh, fall 2023, Deranged Detective was the worst performing one, but that was still a 7.44. The worst overall of the year was Spy Classroom. Did you want? Are you do you watch season four and five? Uh, I watched season four, not five yet. Would you consider it a mystery? Yes. Okay. It's it, it well because no because I I didn't read I mean I didn't watch that. The main plot so, is that they work at a detective agency. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, romance. You got Angel Swells. Angel Next Door Swells. Be rotten. Dangerous in my heart. Horror me a piece. And uh, one hundred girlfriends. And unfortunately, horror me a piece didn't win. Because it lost out by zero point zero two points to Dangers in My Heart, uh, a girl and her guard dog was the worst performing romance across the whole oh, so year. I don't know. Uh, I actually, you don't know. Um, I was thinking about we should probably talk about this show at that time it before it aired, yeah. and we dodged the biggest bullet. Five point six five. That's awful. By any into, metrics, it's awful, yeah. Now we move into the most awful genre, <clears throat> sci-fi. Dragon Stampede, Heavenly Delusion, the best that came out in uh, in summer 2023 for sci-fi was Sin Duality Noir at 6.76. You got a sequel, bro. Yeah, no, season, yeah, season two. Uh, 8.35 for Dr. Stone New World 2, uh, which then made it the best performing sci-fi. The worst was Fully Cooly Grunge. Slice of Life. It, uh, it's not even a competition at this point. The best one was My New Boss is Goofy with a close second for Farming Life in Another World. By the Grace of the Gods is considered to be a Slice of Life. Um, by the Grace of the Gods, I don't even know why By the Grace of the Gods is on here. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just going to skip sports because it's Zerune. Uh That's about it. Super, uh, yeah. uh, but I, I Shout out to... Uh, second and third place being Uma Musume and Captain Tsubasa. I mean, those are still pretty hype IPs in general. Yeah. But, but yeah. Well, second place was actually Uma Musume. Wait, what did I say? Uh, Captain Tsubasa. Right. But Uma Musume second. Uh, technically second. Uh, actually, third was... Um, oh, Birdie, fuck you, Birdie, Birdie Wing. Wing. Yeah. <laughs> just, just, uh, just, uh, just under Uma Musume. Oh, shit. Uh, Supernatural. Don't go straight out season four and five uh, for um, for for winter and summer. Uh, spring was Oshinoko and Tokyo Revengers was for uh, fall. Oshinoko being the number one. Uh, let's not talk about the last one because Yamashibai. Uh, yeah, Yamashibai 11, right. Yeah. Suspense was uh, kind of the great snow sea for both best and worst for uh, for winter. My Home Hero was the best suspense show. For uh, for for spring, uh, run for the money. The great mission was uh, was terrible. What is that? No idea. Zon one hundred uh, came up uh, as the number one for um, uh, for, 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 for 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 yeah. We need to summer. F- we need to freeze the yeah, row. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. summer, Miggy and Dali came in at uh, the the best for winter. A it, massive shift, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah. But uh, unfortunately, still not enough to actually make it the number one, uh, which is Zon one hundred. Um, but that does mean for me, I'm not sure about you, but for me, maybe we should have a look at Miggy and Dolly because the 7.81 is immense. Oh, no, no. Yeah. I, I uh, If there is anything that I've learned uh, just by looking not only at the stats, but just seeing a massive entry when I was checking uh, fall. Yeah. It was just like, what? Yeah. Where did this come from? So the best adventure drama fantasy has to go to Fieden. Like, no doubt, right? Yeah, I think Fiera and taking the cake, like, taking the crown for a lot of these genres is very understandable, right? Yeah. Um, I think that regardless of how we feel about how genres are defined as, uh, it's such a mess. Yeah. We now go into the next part, which is breaking down genres by... Which studios have done them? Now, this is not necessarily anything conclusive. We don't necessarily have a lot of trends to talk about here. Uh, it's only because there were studios that did a fuck ton of shit. So, for example, OLM. They had action, adventure, comedy, drama, fantasy, romance, 
Uh, they also had horror, mystery, slice of life, sports, supernatural. They did a bit of everything, but it seemed to do the most work in the fantasy and drama section. Like, what are these colors those, for? Those are to be like the the most uh, times that tag has shown up. Yellow is the second most, or at least like second and third. Right. Uh, so, for example, like A One Pictures, they do a whole lot of fantasy, uh, fantasy sci fi, and action. No doubt, right? Uh, what was interesting was. Um, the uh, for 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 Cloverworks, they kind of just did a bit of everything, a bit of action, a bit of comedy, a bit of romance, a bit of slice of life. Uh, no surprises for JC staff, uh, where the top three, well, the number one was fantasy, followed by adventure, and then romance, and then action. Um, so, but then they also had like a bunch of stuff that were in like comedy, drama, uh, and supernatural, and all that. So they're they're a very varied studio. Uh, Mappa. Mostly fantasy drama, but that was because they have things like Hell's Paradise, mm-hmm. and they have JJK, and they have... Well, actually, no, JJK is not fantasy or drama. Uh, no, drama? I would say drama in JJK, right? Yeah, I yeah. would say so. Like, like character drama, I think so. I think one of the things that even if the definitions of a genre is, I would say, in both of our opinions, kind of ambiguous or poorly defined because it's consistent in our data set it therefore means it is uh valid it is just unreliable do you know what i mean like as in yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. but what i can see here is it seems very apparent that a it is very indicative at least judging by the amount of green and yellows like the distribution of genres that is produced every year which makes sense because they're from kind of the same um, data set. But what I will say is that when there is no pattern, there actually is something that you can we can observe, which is maybe the genre is less defined by the competency or the, the taste of uh, a studio that is willing to do, which makes sense. Because if you think about even Kyo Annie, other than the aesthetic look of it, right? Tsurune Sports. You would then think of, a, you know, would you consider Violet Evergarden in the same breath related to Tsurune, even if if we exclude the Kyoani connection? No. What's the What's the one where the girl lives in the market? The girl lives in the market, and then there's a really fat pigeon or a fat uh, a bird in there, and they they sell like those little mochis with like the the red beans inside. What? There's a. Uh, I'll, I'll look it up, but uh, you can talk about your observation. I'll, I'll look it up. Oh no! But what? What? And what? By which studio? By QA. Oh, Tamago Market. There we go. Yeah, literally a yeah, market. Yeah, but yeah. So it's like those. Those three have absolutely no relation in terms of style and genre. But it's like I you guess wouldn't... we can say slice of life, but not according to my anime list. I guess no. So so that's what I mean. That like, it is valid is just not reliable. Yeah. So it means that... There, there's some validity. I mean, for example, like Project Number 9, the most used tech they have is romance. I would be more interested in if they do etchy. Yeah, I didn't actually look into that one, but um, that's, that's... I mean, I more, understand why you didn't go down that rabbit hole. It's, it's like, not worth it. No, but, not at all. But, but I would say I would not be surprised if, like, you know, Zero G... Project number nine has a lot of etchy tags or harem tags, I mean, right? Sergi also did a lot of like fantasy romance and comedy. Right. You can imagine there'd be some etchy in there too, yeah. Absolutely. So and I think also it's partly due to the the vision of the director and the script writer and the series composition. So kind of the studio is a bit more ambiguous uh not ambiguous, um interchangeable to a certain extent. Yeah. Yeah, look, I think I think like there's gonna be like certain series that like I mean certain studios that when you see those tags like it makes absolute sense. Like Mappa, the top three are and, and it, it, it's 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 action and adventure and fantasy, makes yep. absolute fucking sense. Yep. Right. And then you have things like um like uh, Leiden films, which has a lot of action. Right. Tokyo Avengers isn't the only one they do. Uh, Studio Dean, uh, for some reason, they keep doing uh, fantasy actions, but are never good at them. <laughs> I don't know it's why. Such a good diss. It, it's it's it sucks to, to see that they are always like doing like action fantasies, but they always turn out kind of trash. They keep trying. 
They're not. They're too stubborn to quit, bro. They, yeah. they, they're the dean, right? They, yeah, they have a uh, pride, right? Yeah. Uh, funny enough, the ones that like you would expect for comedy, like for example, like JC Staff, uh, not even like the top producer of like comedy genre. It was actually Silverlink, followed by um, by Kokumi, as well as TMS Entertainment. But TMS Entertainment is because of the fact that they do um, Doctor Stone. There's a lot of comedy in that, which I don't think. I actually don't think Doctor Stone is all that funny. I think it's entertaining, but like I don't think it's funny at all. Yeah, it, the the these tags and genres are all over the place. Yeah, and it makes it even more apparent when we chart it out like this, and we can't seem to see any. There, there's no pattern. Yeah, or or conclusion that we can like comfortably make, and I think in the that in itself says a lot about the system that is in place. Yeah. Rather, it's more just down to our own intuitions, right? Like when you see Kiwani, you know what to expect. When you see Orange or UFO Table, you know what to expect. Seeing these numbers broken down, it's like, okay, fine. Yeah, JC stuff do a fuck ton of fantasy, but how many of them are actually memorable? Yeah. You know, like how many do you actually think, like, they do a, lo- they do a fuck ton of like fantasy adventure and romance? But again, like, I feel like if I see JC staff, I would actually be more looking into like what they do for romance, slice of life, comedy, but they actually don't produce a lot of those kinds of genres. I think also there are there are some studios that, for better or for worse, are known for certain things in the zeitgeist, or they pride themselves on their identity. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's take the most obvious example. If I say Studio Orange, you know it's going to be in three D, and it's going to be very fluid and. Compet- like extremely done, well done 3D. And more often than not, it's usually quite depressing. Yeah. But even if you take the depressing, uh, even though I think it's extremely accurate, right, aside, or like UFO tables tendencies of fucking off for like two years, then coming back and then making a huge impact or involving themselves only in two IPs for like 10 years. That to me is more in the in the more colloquial sense, what I identify with in terms of certain studios, like MAPPA being, oh, the JJ, the hype action series, right? Yeah. So well, what we can really gather from here is that, you know, these are studios that are not only busy, but willing to do anything, right? Like Silverlink, JC Staff, Light and Films, even now Geek Toys as well. MAPPA, even though it is very much centered around fantasy action adventure, if there is one of those kind of shonen series that is action adventure, you know that MAPPA is going to be like, I'm in. I'm also curious, like, how much of these fantasy shows are isekai shows? Oh, probably a lot. I mean, there's a, there was a yeah, lot. There were right? a lot. Because when I think back, there isn't a lot of shows that is like a Fieren where it is not an isekai. It is str- almost like a fantasy. strict Lord of the Rings type fantasy. So uh, I'm not surprised that fantasy has a lot of... Um, uh, animes associated with that uh, genre, but I'm curious, and I don't need to find out. Like, oh, there's that. There was that one that Black Sorcerer, Black Summoner, Black Summoner. Yeah, yeah. There, that's a that's a fantasy isekai, harem. Yeah, kind there, of. I don't there, know. Oh yeah, there were a lot of harems last year as well. Yeah, Harem Lab came out. That's last why year. I think like certain tags would probably be more hilarious to 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 like find out. Like, oh. Project number nine, guys. Uh, you know, you know that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm not saying we should go down that route. But I'm just saying, like, but it's also like it's just really I, annoying. What's sometimes. the point? It's really annoying where it's like when you have like adventure, it's almost like a reflex that you would put action in it or put fantasy in it. But if you're doing slice of life, it has to only be slice of life. It cannot be funny. It cannot be action focused. It cannot have any romance, and it cannot be dramatic. Like, why is it that certain tags have such stringent rules as to why it's defined that way, but you could be as, like, flexible as you want to be for, like, supernatural or fantasy? Yeah, and I think the tag stuff only happened recently. Like, probably last year or the late 2022. I I think there were definitely tags, but, like, in terms of, like, the explosion of throwing, like, five or six tags all at once on one thing, like, that's definitely been, like... A more recent phenomenon, and it it, it, it kind of grinds my gears a bit because it just it just shows that like 
you don't necessarily have the i'm not saying they have the right or wrong people but i think it's just like when you're putting the hands of like these people like in control of what defines this particular genre it it's very misleading it it, it doesn't make it feel like i mean i i wouldn't consider jc staff to be a studio that solely does fantasy even though they produced seven series out of the eights that had fantasy in it yeah and i don't remember a single one of them yep but if I were to tell you some, you'll probably be like, oh, yeah, I guess I can see in a certain way why there will be fantastical elements in it. I don't agree with it, but I can see it, right? Yeah. So uh, the the Mal uh, tag genre thing is a sad state of affairs, and I am not saying I know the answer because I don't, uh, and I don't want to fix it. I just don't care about it. I'm not saying I don't care about you doing this, but it's more of like when I see it like right here. It, it just shows like the the inaccuracies and things that need to be improved on the Mal platform. You know what you should do? Just don't do it. How about that? Or 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 I don't know. I actually, you know what? That's not the right thing to say. I just don't know. Yeah, like it's just not this. It, right? It's just not this. Yeah, because I know th- it's not this. Because well, right? we did it for last year, and it was like. Again, another one of those, well, no shit. Like, of yeah, course, it's, yeah. It's like the Crunchyroll, like, anime awards of there's a certain subgenre or certain category that we're just like, what is this? Why is this considered this? Best fantasy. Oh, there was Jobless Reincarnation. <laughs> we're giving it to AOT. No, we're giving it to Demon Slayer. Yeah. <laughs> Even right. though it's based in a real feudal Japanese setting. Anyways. I have no clue. We're going to be rounding off this discussion with a final little tidbit in terms of looking at where adaptation sources came from. Uh, so you would imagine that, like, yeah, manga is probably going to be the number one. And it was. Uh, overall, manga uh, was adapted into anime 76 times out of the 211 series. What was interesting, though, was that in, in in winter and in summer, there were actually more adaptations that came from light novels than manga. And that's probably where we started seeing a lot of the explosions of isekais, of fantasies, of reincarnations, of reverse uh, isekais and all that. Um, I remember there being a lot of isekais in winter and summer. Uh, a lot of them in fall as well. <clears throat> Um, not that many originals, but it was the the third quote unquote source in terms of like you know how anime was adapted and all that. Uh, there were also other tags in terms of like sources. So there was web mangas, mixed media, games, four comas. Other was like that came up a bit more often than it should have. Novel it came up twice. Visual novel there was one. Uh, music there was one, and there was also a card game that was one. Surprisingly. Card Fight Vanguard did not derive from a, a card game, but rather a mixed media. Uh, interesting how they come up with those, these kinds of things. Um, but yeah, it's it's, it's to almost... To me, this a, makes more sense. Yeah. Because uh, I'm not saying there's not inconsistencies, but mixed media, I would assume it's like if you have a card game and an anime, it technically is a mixed media of sorts, right? And okay, like what goes before what? Like chicken or the egg, right? So I don't know, right? But uh, web manga is very easily understandable. Original, extremely easy. Light novel, manga, novel, visual novel. Like, those are very easy for me to grasp, right? Mixed media. There were a lot of idol shows last year. Yep. Yeah, a lot of music-based, but, like, not necessarily just, like, directly straight from music. Shout out to Hypnosis Mike. Yep. I still haven't watched the sequel. (laughs) I think we should just sit down and just laugh our asses off and just be drunk out of our minds while having a blast. Yeah. At some point. It looks like it's almost like an even split between manga and light novels, right? Like, And I'll be fair. I thought there would be way more light novels. Just adaptations. based on how many how many fantasy and isekais yeah, there were? Yeah, and like villainous isekai, you so know? A quarter of the things that came out last year were they're adapted from light novels. Like a third of them were from manga. But what was interesting was that just over 10%, so 23 out of 211... Uh, anime series were anime originals. Now, unfortunately, I did not have the time to crunch down how each one of these source adaptations came down. No need to. No need to. Uh, uh, I can say I can safely say the originals. There wasn't really anything memorable last year, unfortunately, and it doesn't seem to be looking that way right now. And for off twenty twenty four off off the dome, I would say manga should be pretty strong with Oshinoko, Fieren, 
being very highly ranked, right? So, uh, and whereas light novels probably have a lot of high rank uh, shows, but there's probably a lot of like very middling guilty pleasure tra- dumpster fire shows. Well, I mean, currently right now in this season, like between light novels and novels, you have like Seven Time Loop, uh, The Wrong Way to Use, Healing Magic, um, Villainous Nine Nine. Yeah. So, there you go. Um, shit. This is I, I actually like doing this breakdown because it was just like it it was very clear that manga was gonna be number one, but I didn't actually think that it would be that low. I thought it'd be I thought there would be more manga adaptations compared to anything else. Like I didn't think that there would be that many like in mixed media, wet manga, I suppose. Like I, I guess if you were to mix like manga and wet manga together, then yeah, then that's like close to like a hundred close to half of the things came in some manga form. Whereas, like, you can group in light novels with novels and visual novels, and it still doesn't really make, like, more than, like, a quarter of the stuff that came out last year. Even though a lot of the series we had were of a fantastical nature. Yeah. It's just interesting when I look at... um, It would be interesting to see the trajectory of if light novels jump in... A massive amount of adaptations because if I were to argue uh, kind of like the long game if isekai start to run dry and typically again typically speaking a lot of the source are from light novels yep. then will that number shrink over that's, time that's actually what I wanted to ask you do you feel that the light novel adaptation number right we're at 59 out of 211 for 2023 like, do you feel that, like, like as you mentioned, we may start running the Isekai fantasy trap, the tap dry? Do you think the number is going to decrease this year? Because we're off to a pretty strong year so far with a lot of Isekai adaptations that do derive from light novels slash novels. That we actually genuinely like yeah. and would recommend, right? So um, there is not to say that there is no good light novels out there, right? But I would even argue actually we would see less originals despite the number being far too low for my liking because I I like anime originals in terms of the ambition of it, but in terms of its reward, for the, the studios, risk you yeah. take. Uh, a lot of people fronting the cost because we talked about production committees are not going to bet on those, especially when money is tight. Yeah, 10% of all anime productions last year being originals, it, it, it does sound kind of high. Yeah. And I think everyone is going to get cold feet, and obviously there will still be, you know, self-financed or, uh, you know, a, a director who wants to do original work. No problem. I will always advocate for it, good or not. I will tell you my thoughts when I see it. But twenty-three is ten percent. Doesn't sound high, but it's still pretty high, dude. There's a number that's a bit too high for me, which is games. Seven games that got that into anime. I don't think so. I don't. I don't think that. I think that's too low. In my opinion, I think they're all garbage, though. No, garbage is one thing, but but in terms of like from a business standpoint, yeah, right? that's why mixed media to me is like unsurprising. In fact, I thought it would be a lot higher, but maybe it's due to their definition. Because if you have a game and you have everything kind of pushed to the forefront in the public sphere, you're going to talk about it, whether it's good or bad, and it's going to generate buzz. Yeah. And then you have like manga right now uh, in 2023 being 76 out of 211. That's just over a quarter, a, a third. And manga ain't dead then, at least from an adaptation standpoint, right? Nope. So I think that is quite cool, to be honest. So obviously manga is always going to be, in general, the number one adaptation source. But yeah, manga, wet manga, and light novels... If you were to add them all together, even like the four coma stuff and all that, that makes up almost three quarters of where all adaptations come from. And I think web mangas <laughs> is also going to decrease. Because if you think about it, right, we have God of High School. We have uh, Noblesse. We have... Oh, by the way, when it says web manga, that's not including manhwa, by the way. Oh. Yeah. 
never mind. I take everything I just said back. I have no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to web manga. Yeah, because for example, like uh, one uh, One Punch Man was originally a web manga before being adapted into a manga, which then became uh, an anime. Is it called P I X Y whatever it's called? You know, you know that like database that a lot of. Um, oh, I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking just about. Just like how a lot of light novels come from the Naru. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Naru I, I think I think yeah, that, that's what. Yeah, that's 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 right. That's what you're talking about. But yeah, interestingly, they separate the wet manga from the manga. But I guess I understand why they need to have that specification. Technically, um, uh, Toma Chan is a girl's a four coma panel, bro. Yeah, they. So, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, though I think that that's why like they have the four coma in here too. I think that's one of the the four that they have. Um, but yeah, um, I I imagine that there will be like Jason said more adaptations coming in from light novels, or at least like there will be more for winter and spring. But then come like summer, fall, ew, who knows? Like we may start seeing a bit of a dry up. But I but the, but on the other side of that too, I just don't see this fantasy isekai train like running off the rails anytime soon especially with the way that 2024 started with the amount of isekais that we have had just this season alone so far we're not even like a month into the year and like now we're looking at what might come in for spring for summer and well shit we have another asap coming up soon too and like not all of the stuff have original sources us being manga some of them actually started off as a light novel but we are going to read the manga source because it's just easier accessibility for us yeah Mm, overall i think 2023 is um a write-off year (laughs) in a lot of respects uh even despite the the like oh average across all four seasons that they were above a seven i think like it was still a good year but there was also a lot of unpredictability throughout the year like who would have thought that we would have seen we would see a massive uptick in um in in in, in dangers in my heart who would have seen that thousand year blood war was going to come in yeah right? oshinoko fieren i i'm fully aware of that i just feel that there is it's such a weird year given the circumstances that are surrounding COVID in the industry and the world that it's tough. Whereas nowadays, more or less, COVID is kind of resolved in, in, in many capacities. So it's, you know, it's, it's just the way it is. Yeah, at least last year we didn't have rusted armors. But we did have Ballbuster. Ballbuster was not that terrible actually it was only a six something fine then you can be a dog i'll I'll bust your balls then shit okay while um i guess we'll bust my balls i will then go into the housekeeping script i have no way to go with the segue um that is the end of our episode for the good night pal podcast oh sorry well do you have any closing thoughts for 2023 retrospective nah i think we we're good on that yeah all right then um if you want to, you we greatly appreciate you leaving a review or rating on uh, your podcast platform of choice. Uh, it's all good. Uh, we appreciate you like reaching out to us if you have any good or bad things to say. We welcome all input. Uh, gapallet at gmail.com. G-A-P-A-L-E-T-T-E. All lowercase, all one word. Uh, our other uh, presence in social media is provided in the show description including a Discord server invite link. We have a website, www.goodanimepalette.com, all lowercase, all one word. And music credits for this episode. Our intro music is Flow To It by Taipa. Our break music is Laser Drops by Hip Color. And our outro music is 2011 by Rocket Jr. You can support the music artists that we feature by listening to them on Spotify, Apple Music, or your music listening platform of choice. And Epidemic Sound provides all of our royalty-free music. If you're interested, you can sign up using the referral link in our show description. Terms and conditions apply. I don't want to rub salt into the wounds of the Fully Cooly fans, but 2023's worst anime was Fully Cooly Grunge. 2022's was Rusted Armors. 2021 was X-Arm. That is, that is some company to be in. Holy shit. Imagine, like, two of the worst 3D animated series of all time. All, and you throw in Fully Cooley, us being the worst of the bunch as well. 
Oh. You went from being an indie darling of sorts, shaping a lot of not only anime and manga creators, but even IRL, you know, Western creators even to a certain... In fact, I would argue the influence on Western's perception of anime is massive from Fooly Cooley's perspective. 2.9 for X-Arm, 3.8 for Rusted Armors, 4.7 for Fooly Cooley. Ouch. Shall we sign off on that then? Yeah. <laughs>